there's a quote that I want to read from one of your tweets that comes from a book, which I just thought was absolutely brilliant, called The Empire of the Summer Moon, about the Comanches, uh, Native Americans. And so here's the quote. You said Comanches loved eating bison. And then this is the quote from the book. Children would rush up to a freshly killed animal, begging for its liver and gallbladder. They would then squirt the salty bile from the gallbladder onto the liver and eat it on the spot, warm and dripping blood. And I was like, okay. So this is a really different way of living. Imagine tracking that animal down. Your hands are all over a horse. God only knows what's on the horse. You then kill that buffalo. You then cut it open, touching its fur and all the dirt and feces and God only knows what is all over it. You cut it open. You reach inside. You pull this out, uh, having done it so many times that the kids know which organs to beg for. And then you give it to people. And I just thought, oh my God, the microbes that people would be ingesting would very rapidly acclimate your microbiome to whatever it is that you eat. So is that part of this or is this going to be, and I know you're guessing, but is this going to be more genome? Is this going to be more microbiome? Which of those two do you think plays out being more important? I do think the adaptability point is a big part of it. And I do think the gastrointestinal tracts of humans, but also of all animals are very adaptable. And um, there is a lot of debate. You know, I've debated with um, people, uh, vegans on Twitter, let's say, about what the humans should eat. And, and we, we have to define should. Right. So should, like, what is, you know, what's healthiest for us, what makes us feel the best, which might be two different things. What's the most moral, what's the most sustainable economically, environmentally? You know, there's many ways to ask what is the quote unquote proper diet for us. But I mean, I do think that... Um, that the adaptability of the gastrointestinal tract is important. And a lot of vegans will point out rightly that, for instance, in the large intestines, humans can ferment plant matter, you know, cellulose and fiber from plants a little bit, not to the extent of cows and other ruminants who have this initial very large stomach that is a fermentation vat basically to draw energy from fibrous uh, material from plants. But we can partially ferment things in our colon, which does suggest we are quote unquote supposed to eat vegetables, uh, but not only vegetables. You know, our, our gastrointestinal tract does not look like a pure carnivore's tract. It also doesn't look like a pure herbivore's tract. So I think we are probably meant to be omnivorous. Now, to what extent should meat be only, you know, used as a flavoring or eaten occasionally, or should it be 90% of the diet? I think variability is a really important thing. And over generations, I, I mean, I think the, the, micro, the microbiome adaptation over some months or years could play a role. Uh, I don't. I'm not. I don't know a lot about that. That could impact how much you're able to ferment in your large intestines, but also over generations, gastrointestinal tracts can adapt in impressive ways. One of the most impressive is actually the panda bear's gastrointestinal tract, where clearly they were a carnivore in the past, almost like other most other bears. Um, but they've adapted to subsist almost wholly on bamboo alone, and their gastrointestinal tract. Their gastrointestinal tract shows that they were a carnivore or at least a meat heavy, heavy omnivore who is now a strict herbivore. And their gastrointestinal tract was able to make that adaptation. And I think ours could adapt similarly, whether we're living in the Arctic and subsisting wholly on animal meat and fat or in some parts of the tropics where people do have a very uh, strictly vegetarian diet. You know, I think we can do a little bit of everything. And so the on debate the will never side, end. On the human side, it's not really a question though, right? So we do... Uh, we have some people right now, even in just North America, that are like, I'm running a carnivore diet experiment for one reason or the other. And then you obviously have people, usually for moral reasons, uh, that have gone strictly vegan. But also in the longevity community, now that debate rages on in terms of what is it that is going to give you longevity. I'll lay out my hypothesis. You've cut open a lot more bodies than I have since my tally is zero uh, and yours is somewhere far north of that. Um, that the way that I think this plays out is from a longevity perspective, I think a vegan diet, and, and let's first define supplement versus non-supplement. Because looking at this from an ancestral perspective, I have to believe that you were in a stressed state if you were eating a purely vegan diet. Um, so from an ancestral perspective, 
I'm guessing this is a hormetic response that we're leveraging now in a modern environment where we can sort of take the edges off of whatever problems a purely vegan diet would otherwise create. That's my assumption that there would be those problems. Um, that through supplementation, we take the edge off. And so we're getting an artificial look at why some people think, why the longevity community seems to keep circling around a vegan diet. Uh, for people that don't know the idea of hormesis, it's saying basically it's a little bad for you, but that gets the body to respond in a way that's positive. And so, and, and my um, guesses here are not uneducated. I've interviewed enough people around this, read so many books on the topic, but I want to be clear that I'm not an expert. <laughs> Um, but that what seems like is happening is if you're eating a lot of meat, you're going to be in mTOR. So you're in a growth phase. You're telling your body grow. This is good times of plenty. But if you're always in that to the earlier comment that you said that variability is probably one of the keys. And so if you're pegged on eating meat, you're going to be pegging mTOR. You're going to speaking from experience, you're going to feel awesome, but because you're pegging that out, you don't get the hormetic effect. You're not shutting down some of those growth things. You're not giving the body, hey, you need to conserve um, calories effectively. So lower your metabolism, do less cellular division. I'm, I'm definitely out, out of my depth here, but that's sort of how I imagine this process. And so while I would categorize, certainly from an evolutionary standpoint, that if you're purely in a vegan situation, you're gonna be surviving, not necessarily thriving. And if you're going hardcore on the eating as much meat as you can get, that you're gonna be thriving, but you're not necessarily optimizing for longevity. How does that feel? I mean, it seems to make sense. I also am not you know, an expert in this area. Um, and I think the, the science is still murky but I, I mean it seems to make sense to me but i think going back to sort of lifestyle and activity level the the food that we have available today for anyone in north america let's say who has disposable income is so dramatically different from what people have had available in the past you know the, the choice of oils and fats to fry things in is sort of mind-boggling at this point when you go to a grocery store versus 100 years ago when it was basically animal art and butter, you know, was sort of your choices. And so now we can import things from olive growing parts of the world, like olive oil. And I also, and our lifestyles are so different. So I think you put, you put someone in a hunter gatherer society who has to work really hard to put food on the table. What's the optimal diet for them? Um, I feel like, you know, they're going to need more meat and fat perhaps than someone in a modern lifestyle. What's driving that hypothesis, the ability to extract calories? Perhaps, I guess, you know, this is all sort of working on what's theoretically making sense in my own mind and how our lifestyles have changed over, over the recent centuries. But I do suppose that in a modern, the, what's optimal for a human living a modern lifestyle where you don't actually have to work very hard for your food physically, and you have all these foods available from all over the world, not only from your own climate and your own environment. I think it's so hard to know. I feel like what's optimal for people that don't know your story. Uh, you're a physician. You talk a lot about two topics, which I think are the reason I wanted to talk to you about this is they collide in this moment. Where we're talking about right now perfectly, which is understanding all the different systems of the body, the different, um, God, what do you call them? The liquids, the bodily fluids. Bodily fluids. Perfect. So <laughs> all of the different systems of bodily fluids that they produce, all of that. Um, and then nutrition. And you coming at nutrition from a, an anatomy eats is the name of your Twitter uh, feed. So, and on that feed, it says you are what you eat. So when I look at these two worlds colliding of, okay, you've got operation of the body and then you've got the things you take in and you are what you eat. Um, how do those two worlds come together and what would you need to know from the body, whether it's urine, blood, whatever, to know, is this diet quote unquote working? The science of nutrition is has changed a lot in recent decades. And I think I'm in general, very skeptical of what doctors have to say about nutrition. And I think just that, because they don't learn about it. Uh, partially, they don't learn about it. When I was in medical school, I went to a public medical school in New Jersey. We had one nutrition course, and it was actually had just been started, and that was in um, about 2000, 2010 and just before. So before that, there had been no nutrition course in the medical school, and it had just started, and it was just very basic. Um, but I think nutrition science is just so hard to uh, 
to, to get right. And nutrition studies are so hard to do just because there's so many variables that have to be controlled in people's lives. And I think that's one reason that study that doctors seem to flip flop on things back and forth, like eggs. I feel like in my, you know, since I was a teenager, I've seen them flip flop back and forth. And to add to that, I think the way the media portrays nutrition science or the latest study or the latest, you know, perhaps very low quality study that shows that eating chocolate is very good for you is going to be a headline everywhere and sort of uh, disproportionately impacts the way people understand nutrition. Sort of nutritional science through headlines is a very bad way to understand what's, what's good and what's bad for us. I do think, though, you know, medicine is very focused on sort of is, is someone having a disease or not? And I think when you get into the finer points of nutrition about optimizing the human body, optimizing performance, um, it's almost beyond the realm of medicine. You know, I can say someone's urine, let's say the tests I can do on the urine are limited. I can say everything looks normal. I, I often say that to my patients when I get their blood and urine tests back. Um, but, you know, the, I, it's hard for... Or, to measure, or there is no measurement I'm aware of, of is this diet optimal for you? You know, I can show that you are not having any vitamin deficiency, that you're not in a state of protein malnutrition, or um, you're not malabsorbing fat in your gut and failing to absorb it, let's say. Um, but going beyond that and optimizing, you know, taking it from you have no nutritional deficiencies to taking it to the optimization is sort of a bigger step that I think medicine is just very in the very beginning stages of, I think. Okay, so going back to the question, if you were trying to take your best swag, um, what would you look at? So my gut instinct is that it's going to be blood, maybe stool would be the ones that I would really want to see if, if to just speak to your current lifestyle, which I would say is, and maybe we disagree about this, but I would say is 80% what you eat, 20% activity, sure um loving relationships all that stuff but man if you want me to impact the quality of your life give me sleep and diet i'm over everything and i'm laughing um blood stool or are there better things to look at in somebody's um bodily fluids do you mean to determine their state of health yeah like i i yeah. re so i really care about the things that I do, what impact do they have? And so this is all building towards me asking, when you cut open that first cadaver and you saw that the lungs were fucking black, you were like, this guy smoked. Right. And so I just, dude, I, again, I understand that to some extent, I'm just ignorant enough that I have so much confidence in what I think. <laughs> it's very dangerous, but it also allows me to move forward in my life. So I am convinced that at some point we're going to realize, oh, when you cut open the arteries and you see this, that tells me that they ate this. And I think it is only a lack of being able to draw a direct correlation between the two because the two worlds are so divorced. So the guy cutting open your heart and looking at your arteries and you know being in charge of repairing that, he's not studying nutrition. And the guy studying nutrition is not cutting open your heart. Right. But I have a feeling that the second that those two things are married and you've got a guy who just knows nutrition forwards and backwards, or this is probably gonna get solved by AI, but whatever entity that is both cutting open the person and looking at what people eat is gonna be like, oh, this is easy. When you're eating a bunch of highly processed food, and this is my punchline, if you're eating a bunch of highly processed food, your arteries are gonna look like trash and you're gonna be storing fat everywhere and it's gonna glom on to your organs and that's just gonna literally choke the ability for the fluids to move through the body in the way that they should, choke it off and you die. And that's like the end of the story. And again, because I'm like on this side of ignorance, it's just, that just seems so clear to me. But I, I am hoping you will either say yes, that all makes sense, or <laughs> slap the ignorance out of me. Either way, I'll take it. Gotcha. Um, let me say, I certainly make it. I th certainly think it makes sense. I certainly think the point at which the cardiothoracic surgeon, who's cutting open your chest, let's say, to look at your arteries, versus the nutritionist. Uh, we're such a long way from those two sort of meeting and marrying each other and knowing for sure. And I guess the trick is that it takes these large population studies to know what what is optimal uh, for people. And that doesn't always tell you what's optimal for the individual, mm. honestly. And studies in the past have been very poor quality and not controlled well for all the variables that exist. Like, for instance, some of the recent uh, multinational studies on, let's say, salt intake 
they're done on much larger scale. They're done with more powerful computers to compute the statistics and do the statistical analysis in a more efficient and better way. And uh, there's more money behind it. And, and they're discovering that perhaps the salt cutoffs, let's say, are not as low as we thought. So I think every you know everyone sort of agrees that eating huge amounts of salt is not good for you. But where's the, the cutoff between a salt that's a, in an okay amount and salt that's too much? And it turns out that we've been being much too strict, you know, and it seems like people could eat more salt without the effects that we've been warning about for a while. Um, so for instance, so those sorts of bigger, better run studies are overturning a lot of what we have thought in the past. But I do think, you know, when you cut open a person, let's say you could look at their arteries and see that they're, there's more plaque built up on the walls or they're stiffer with more calcium because of injury. Uh, you could look at their liver and see there's more fat accumulated there, you know, in a fatty liver disease, which could be either from alcohol or could, could be from the modern lifestyle and diet, which causes non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, which is very G common. Give me what you think is actually going on there. So the alcohol one's pretty simple. Right. But it when you say modern liver. lifestyle, right. that's an abstraction. Get into the specifics. What in the modern lifestyle? Sitting around? Yeah. So I think, you know, again, it's complicated since there's so, so many things happened at once to change human life and human diet over the last, let's say, century and a half um, in the developed world that it's hard to pinpoint. But doctors refer to something called the metabolic syndrome, which is a constellation of conditions that include type 2 diabetes, high blood pressure, high cholesterol, chronic kidney disease, and fatty liver disease. And that whole constellation, which can appear to different extents in different people, someone might have all those, someone might have a few or one, um, that seems to, that constellation of, of diseases, that syndrome seems to be much more common these days. And is that due to some, probably due to the change in our lifestyle, less physical activity, a change in diet, but you know, what is it exactly that's doing it? Perhaps a combination of the two, but you, you see a lot of people, you know, obesity obviously plays in, a role in there as well, but I see a lot of patients who are not obese at all and still have some version or some portion of the metabolic syndrome. And I think it seems like something about modern life has caused that, um, or at least has made that much more common these days. But what exactly is it, I think, is really hard to know. I think doctors, when they've tried to show causality of eating this causes that, we've gotten into so much trouble and ended up looking like idiots so many times and continuously we still do, um, that I'm so hesitant to draw conclusions, you know, until the platonic ideal of the large population nutrition studies are complete to show us like what really is, is causing um, us to be less healthy. I find if you want to know what somebody really believes, you need only ask what they do with their kids. What do you do with your kids? Um, so I, I encourage my kids to eat as wide a variety as possible. I feed Including them. Including Oreos. Um, you know, occasionally. I mean, so for instance, in my mind, I feel like, you know, processed food seems to be not the optimal choice of what you should eat or what your kids should eat. Um, some, a lot of studies seem to suggest that. Would I bet my life on it? No. Do I think if you went back to a hunter gatherer people who, uh, do an Olympic athletes amount of physical work each day and gave them a, lots of Doritos, like, would it really make them less healthy? I kind of don't think so because they're living such a physically active lifestyle and their diet is so well balanced with everything else they eat. Like maybe they could eat a lot of junk food and be fine. I don't know. And that study is probably impossible to do. But um, I do find it silly. For instance, I, I hear pediatricians sometimes recommending that a child's diet have more olive oil and less butter. And there is no study on children that shows olive oil is better. There's study on probably unhealthy American 60 year olds, maybe that show olive oil might be better than butter. Even those, I'm, I'm skeptical of those studies, but to then take that nutrition, that nutritional uh, data or evidence from adults and apply it to otherwise healthy children, I think is very silly. And I think there's no reason to think olive oil is, is more healthy in a healthy child than, uh, than butter. What's the difference between uh, the way that a kid will respond and an adult? Um, I, th I think it has to do with, at least in the doctor's mind, it has to do with sort of risk factors. You know, we, there's some evidence that uh, unsaturated fat is better than saturated fat for things like coronary artery disease. Although that evidence also, I think is, uh, I'm a little skeptical of it, or at least the, I don't believe the full picture has, has totally been drawn yet. So I think for the, the adult with five out of the six conditions of the metabolic syndrome, who's already had three heart attacks and has eight stents in their heart. Yes, probably nitpicking their source of fat uh, is more worthwhile than in a healthy child 
who almost no matter what they eat is not going to have coronary artery disease for decades to come. Um, so I, I think there's a lot of applying uh, nutritional information from one population to another, for instance, from adults to children, or for instance, from, let's say, white Europeans to other people, um, when the variability is just too great, um, especially between adults and children. Mm. This is so interesting to me. So um, I want to go back to the the primal way of living. So you had another tweet that was like, you should embrace the primal side of life as readily as you embrace the intellectual side of life. Do you mean that spiritually or do you mean like that's just going to be better for you at a cellular level? Well, that, that's a good question. I, I guess that plays into uh, the psychology uh, and how psychology and emotion, our emotional lives affect the cellular level. You know, clearly there's some some correlation there between our emotional and psychological lives and how well our guts work. You know, there's a lot of conditions that we deal with, IBS and others, that uh, where there some seems to be some connection with, um, you know, mental duress or psychiatric disease and, and gastrointestinal function, let's say, or sleep and psychiatric illness and health. Uh, there's a lot of connections there between the body and the mind that that we really haven't figured out yet. And I think doctors sort of poo-poo a lot of those things. But the causality is not clear, but it's clear there's some tie-in with psychology. And I think being um, embracing the primal side of life, I, I guess by that I sort of meant, um, you know, realizing where we came from, understanding where our food comes from, that for 99.9% .9 of human history, we've lived by... Uh, lived and eaten and survived by killing other things, whether it's ripping mushrooms out of the ground, uh, felling trees, killing, uprooting plants, or killing other animals. You know, that's sort of where we come from. That's where everything we put into our mouth comes from, from the flesh of another organism. Not all of them have to die for us to eat. Yes, fruit do fall from a tree that continues to live. But um, I think even just recognizing where things come from, and I do try to instill that in my kids, you know, meat doesn't come from the store it comes from the body of another animal and you are made of exactly the same stuff and if we zoomed in with a microscope on that piece of meat or the muscle in your leg no one would be able to tell the difference because we're made of the same stuff and i think that is i understand why people are sometimes grossed out by that but there's certainly a beauty there and i often tell my kids about the circle of life i say um and that's one of them you know that everything that dies becomes food why or do you want them to understand that um, perhaps because I find it so beautiful and intellectually satisfying and stimulating and fascinating. And I think those are important lessons, you know, to understand where things come from. I think that's something I've always been interested in. Um, not in childhood, but actually in adulthood, I got interested in where do these things from the store come from? Or how did, how, are, how is technology made from how metals are extracted from the ground and how... Uh, all the way back to the beginning of how we take from the natural world and turn it into the things around us that seem so artificial and seem to have no connection to the natural world. Of course, they have their source in the natural world. I, I was similarly fascinated with a lot of the medications that we use in, in modern medicine. Many of them come from uh, the natural world, from fungi, from plants, from the bodies of other animals, even from the bodies of other humans. Uh, we make medicines out of everything, just like we make sort of useful devices for our own life out of out of everything. And I, I think there's a beauty in that, and it helps you understand the world and how, why the world is the way it is, why things are shaped the way and act the way they are and do, uh, why people lust after the things they lust after. You know, the, the, the circle of life of food and death is also the circle of life of how feces becomes fertilizer for plants to grow more food. You know, there's all these sort of intertwining circles. And I think, I don't know, understand, I guess, having my kids understand the way the world works as part of my job as a parent. One of the things that I was drawn to reading your book, and this may be a misread on you, but one of the things I took away, which may be projection, uh, is that you take a very dispassionate look at the way that the body works. There's a story that you tell in the book. The note I took was like, is this guy Hannibal Lecter? <laughs> you were driving down the road. You saw a deer on the side of the road. You pulled over drug the deer into the woods so that passers-by would not see what you were about to do and you skinned the deer now you've been trained how to do this so it wasn't like oh the first roadkill i see i just want to cut it open and see right. what's inside but uh so when i was reading all of that i was like so i 
if I were going to have an epitaph put on my tombstone, I would want it to say, you're having a biological experience. <laughs> now, to me, there's something deeply spiritual in that, but I'm trying to get people to understand there's a very grounded, real way. Your body works in a certain way. Your mind works in a certain way. The things that you eat will react in a certain way. They may be too complex for today's technology for us to track what that is, but there is a way. And ultimately, I think, through AI and better technologies, we'll actually be able to track all that stuff and it will really become de rigueur to say, okay, on a lifespan, you're working out this much, sleeping this much, getting this much sunlight, eating these things with that microbiome, this is gonna be the outcome of plaque in your arteries. And that will really be able to, to build some terrifyingly predictive models, which right now for anybody who wants to cut through the BS, look at the insurance industry. They're literally betting that they know what are the things that are going to kill you and keep you living longer. Hmm. And so I think they're the, the people to beat. But I think that ultimately we'll be able to beat that. So anyway, that's how I think people ought, and I use that word on purpose, people ought to look at the world if they want to have a better life. Is that, have I misinterpreted you that you have a similarly, like you just need to understand what's going on at a cellular level. And that's why you say you are what you eat. And that's why you're fascinated by skinning an animal. Uh, or is there something more spiritual to what you were just walking through with the circle of life and understanding where we fit? I think that it's a, a little bit of a combination. I got interested in the life ways of ancient peoples uh, in my early 20s. And like I said, I wanted to know just where everything came from, how everything was made, how people figured out everything that we know these days and so um one of the things i did in, in that journey of exploration was take a wilderness survival course where i learned how to make stone tools in the the way that people did for most of our history certainly much longer than we've dealt with any of the technology surrounding us today uh how you know everything from tracking an animal to making rope from the bark of a tree to uh um setting traps you know kind of everything that uh, a person in their natural state let's say in nature with no artifice around them except their own body their own flesh uh how would they survive or how would they manipulate the world around them in order to make themselves more comfortable and more able to survive uh, so the the use of skins uh to make clothing not and even to make paper let's say you know parchment um america's founding documents are basically written on animal skin uh and so the the use of skins i guess just really fascinated me and this was before i went into medical school i certainly do think there's something spiritual there i i think but uh for me the the spirituality is in understanding how people have lived throughout history and what our bodies are kind of designed to do whoever whoever or whatever you think the designer is clearly our bodies have a design in a particular way you know every body part and every bodily fluid has a purpose that seems particularly designed for a specific problem of everyday life with the human body. Everything uh, everything that we're made of and everything, the way it's shaped, the way it flows, makes perfect sense uh, from the, the human mind perspective of problem solving and kind of getting the job done and keeping the human organism alive. So I think I like understanding the world around me. There's a pleasure in, in that fascination and that understanding. I sort of just have always wanted to know more and how everything works. And I think there is, for me at least, a spiritual side to that knowledge, to understand why our bodies are the way they are, why we act the way they do, why human history proceeded the way it did. So do you think that you're naturally unsqueamish or is it this <laughs> sort of loop of wanting to understand where it's from, that bringing both a biological and a spiritual connection to everything that gives you an intellectual framework to not be freaked out. I think I'm definitely not squeamish to start with. Though I do think something I learned in medical school when we started dissecting our cadavers on the first day of school, we met our cadavers, it was four students for each body. And I think everyone was surprised by how quickly we got used to it. Even people who were, let's say, not uh, n more squeamish than I am, let's say, like I have a friend who ended up being a psychiatrist who I write about in the book, and the sight of blood made him faint for most of his life. And here he Whoa. was in front of a dead human body he was now tasked with cutting open. And Is he, there blood, though, in a cadaver? There isn't blood, but he's sort of just a squeamish person. <laughs> and sort of blood was not the only thing that freaked him out. Mm. Uh, but no, there's no blood. It's actually all been drained out and replaced with a preservative sort of 
similar to formaldehyde, though not exactly formaldehyde. Um, but even he, throughout medical school, got less and less squeamish. You know, he would be on, let's say, his surgery rotation where he was cutting open a lot of bodies, seeing a lot of blood, and blood didn't phase him anymore. But then for the next six weeks, he was on a psychiatry rotation, and that squeamishness crept back in, and he sort of lost that. Um, Interesting. Lost what he had gotten used to. I think I started from a less squeamish baseline, um, and then I think just the intellectual understanding or the desire to understand how things work. Uh, sort of helped me not be squeamish even further. Um, you know, being fascinated with the process of turning animal skin into buckskin or clothing or leather, I just find so fascinating. There's no room for squeamishness. Why there, do you have to rub brains on it? That's so there's so many weird, right? So skin. You know, when you uh, take skin off a living animal, human or otherwise, it will either rot and it will stay wet and rot, or it will dry and be really hard, almost like cardboard, neither of which is good for clothing, let's say, or any other material that we'd want to use in our daily life. So you have to find a way to keep, to make it dry so it doesn't rot, but have it soft. And so humans throughout the world have figured out many different ways of doing that. But one of the common ways in uh, North America, um, the tribes, a lot of them used brains and there's something about brains. It could be these molecules called glycolipids where half the molecules sugar and dissolves in water and half the molecules lipid and dissolves in fat. Hmm. It could be those two sided molecules, sort of like an emulsifier that attaches to the collagen fibers and skin and the, you know, the wavy, the way I picture on the molecular level, these wavy fatty acid tails between the fibers are keeping things lubricated. Perhaps I don't know that anyone knows. No one's committing a lot of money to researching why brain tanning a hide works so well. Um, but I think that uh, people have also used eggs, people have, which have um, emulsifiers that are used, like in the yolk especially, are used in food products like called lecithins or lecithins. Um, people have rubbed liver into hides, soap into hides, and all kinds of other things. Um, so I don't know that it's known why it works, but the product is really amazing. And the transformation too, which I had seen before I dragged that deer into the woods, I had seen the transformation from this stinky, wet, uh, gross, sloppy hide into this luxurious material that's almost finer than the highest quality suede that I've seen and just got so fascinated with that transformation. So I think in this gross uh, raw thing in front of me, I see that finished product perhaps because I've been through the process before and you use your own muscles and sweat to soften the hide once the brain's been applied. And I just love the physicality of it and the hands-on nature of it and the transformation. So I perhaps seeing that transformation in my mind helped me be even less squeamish about the initial product, which can be quite unpleasant. Mm. All right. So there's certainly moral implications to killing animals and things like that. But before we get to that part of the carnivore vegan debate, um, I would love to get a better understanding of when you say that we are what we eat, that's one of the things where I think about vegetable matter and I'm like, I get why there's going to be things in that that are going to be useful to us at a cellular level, but also seems impossible to get all the muscle built up and everything that we would need without eating meat. Now, I know it's not true because I know that people can certainly with supplementation eat a vegan diet forever and um, certainly live. Uh, so you you make a point of saying that we are what we eat. What What is my takeaway from that? All right, so on the most basic biochemical or physiologic level, to me, it means that you know nothing in our body stays the way it is for very long. Even the longest lived cells, which might be in the muscles of the heart or in the brain, even those have a turnover. There's this constant churn in everything that we're made of where nothing, no individual specific molecule is gonna stay there for long. Everything is constantly being broken down and rebuilt from new materials. Uh, and you could, you could think of that constant churn as metabolism and we're constantly replacing everything in us right just like um, you can never put your foot in the same river twice because it constantly changes our bodies are kind of constantly changing from minute to minute and the, the new material for rebuilding uh, everything comes from food you know there's also obviously the the uh, oxygen in the air is a big part of it too that gets incorporated into a lot of what becomes human flesh um, but uh, most and water of course but everything else uh, is food from other organisms that goes in our mouth, we break it down in our intestines and absorb it and use it as the building material to refashion ourselves. And we're constantly refashioning ourselves 
nothing is ever staying the same for long. And that's part of staying healthy. You know, if you're, if you're not changing, you're stagnating. So in many other ways, you know, perhaps in a business environment too, you have to sort of constantly innovate, constantly change, constantly renew yourself. And so the same is true in the human body. And so it's all food that becomes us. I mean, every bit of flesh came from food or from the air that we breathe. And do you, is it, um, at a cellular level completely, um, it just doesn't matter whether it comes from meat or from plants. I've heard people say that plants, vegetable matter does not have a complete amino acid profile. Um, true, false. So uh, I'm not a nutritional expert, but I do think, you know, there's many vegan diets that if you're not careful and don't pay attention to certain nutrients, you can become deficient. Uh, you know, B12 is a common vitamin that's found in all sorts of meat products and much less in plants. Uh, and if you're not careful, you can be deficient in that. Same with protein. You know, there are many plant sources of protein. And if you're careful, it's not hard to get enough protein. But it's perhaps you know, much easier to get protein if you're eating animals. I do think with the way the food supply is these days, the way the you know nutritional supplement supply, the nutritional understanding of what the human body needs and our, our lifestyles where we don't have to uh, jump out of a tree branch onto the back of a deer and strangle it to put food People on the plate. did that? What's that? I, I have never heard <laughs> of that as a method for killing a deer. Well, if you don't have any weapons, let's say, if you found, found yourself in the Very wilderness impressive. with no weapons, uh, perhaps that's always an option. Do they teach that in survival? No. I mean, that, you give it and you take it away. For a second there, I thought this was like a thing and there was like a, a known tribe that they would just choke them out. Yeah. Well, there is, there's a, actually one of the first wilderness survival courses I took was in New Jersey. There's this guy named Tom Brown who um, sort of grew up in the Pine Barrens, a sort of wilderness area in southern New Jersey and was supposedly taught by this older Indian uh, Native American from the Southwest who had uh, migrated there. And that was something in one of his stories, he actually does do that, jumps out of a tree with a huge knife and kills a deer. That is against all hunting laws. Um, I am not advocating. Do not I've, try this at home. I've never done that and probably would never. I mean, weapons are not hard to find these days. So um, it's rare to find yourself uh, naked and afraid, perhaps in the wilderness somewhere we have to resort to that. But I guess I just meant that we don't have to, you don't have to physically exert yourself almost at all. Even nowadays, more than 10 years ago, you can do everything without leaving your house. You know, my kid gets piano lessons. We don't have to take more than 10 steps over the piano and it's through mm -hmm. the computer. Everything we do these days uh, requires less and less physical activity, almost approaching, uh, you know, the singularity of never having to move. Uh, so I think that, but with all the supplements available, with the food supply where we can get anything from any part of the world at any time, uh, winter or summer, and with our understanding of nutrition, I think that you probably can be uh, healthy as a vegan, as where in a hunter-gatherer society, you didn't really have a choice uh, as much in the past as you do today. All right. So then let me ask the obvious question. Why do you eat liver? Like if you could eat strawberries and be fine, what are you doing? Right. Me personally, do you yeah. mean? Yeah. Well, one, I like it. I did not like it as a kid. It was a, a chopped liver was a tradition in my family. It was on the table at every holiday. I thought it was totally gross. I thought it tasted like rotten iron, pretty much, whatever that Sounds is. Sounds delicious. Um, but then after, as I talk about in the book, learning about the liver and just understanding this incredibly complex organ that does a million and one things on a daily basis to keep our, our bodies alive and healthy, realizing that that complicated, uh, amazing thing inside each of our abdomens is the, pretty much the exact same thing, of, although from an animal, that is chopped up in that bowl on the table at the holiday. Uh, it's sort of similar to that, you know, perhaps that transformation of the, the gross, wet, raw hide off an animal into that beautiful buckskin that has a million and one uses in daily life. It's sort of like, uh, oh, these two things are connected. That's exactly where this, thing's come fr this thing comes from. I never considered that the chopped liver was actually coming from this internal organ that is so complex inside the abdomen of these animals. And now it's mixed with fried onions, you know, on the holiday table. Um, so I think that fascination alone probably helped me similarly get over my squeamishness and get over my childhood disgust for the dish. And like many things, but how does it get you over it tasting like rotten iron? 
you know, the humans can get used to a lot of things. Not only, let's say, the sight of their cadaver and the smell of the cadaver lab as a medical student, which people do get used to. Um, but also, I mean, the taste of alcohol, let's just say when I first tried hard liquor as a teenager, I wasn't impressed with the taste. And now I love it. I don't even know if that, do I actually like the taste or do I just more like the effect? Mm. And I know that's the, uh, you know, that's the beautiful buckskin at the end of the dealing with this gross hide. Um, or do I actually like the taste? I think I actually like the taste, even though it still sort of burns your mouth. It's pretty gross, uh, but it's still this amazing thing. And so I think humans, we can get used to a lot. And there's a lot in the food world, too, that takes some getting used to. And that is an acquired taste. And I think liver is one of those. And now that I've tried it so many times, I love it. And if it was a holiday without it on the table, I'd probably be outraged. That's so interesting. Okay, so why do so many animals go straight for the liver? It's a good question. I, I just read about some orcas off South Africa that have been killing sharks and eating only their liver and leaving the rest of it, which I find very interesting. Um, I guess they have good taste probably as part of it, but um, they, you know, I, I'm not really sure why. Perhaps there's a, are they going because of a nu nutritional deficiency? I, it's possible. You know, there's a lot of nutrients in liver. It's one of the most nutrient packed thing you can put into your mouth. Um, not only iron, which contributes to the taste, uh, but a variety of other things as well. Uh, I don't know why animals go for that, but that, that's a fascinating topic. Like which body parts do animals go for first? Often it's the internal organs. Uh, sometimes it's the bone marrow, which is very fatty and a, a great source of fat. I mean, polar bears will often eat all the fat off uh, seals as the first thing. Uh, but in the Arctic, it's a particular matter of kind of calculating nutrients. And fat is clearly the source of nutrients that everybody needs just because it's so um, nutrient dense and, and calorie dense. Um, so I think that's an interesting fact. But what is the process there of the, hu of the animals? Are they considering, oh, am I in the mood for the meat today? Am I in the mood for the liver? Do I... Does my tummy hurt? So I'm going to avoid the fat today. I'm not sure that that kind of processing happens, but I do wonder. I also wonder, for instance, how do adolescent lions know to bite the animal's neck? Like, how do they know that's going to kill them? Is it just because they saw their parents do it? Is it because they understand something about the physiology and that's where the big blood vessels are? I'm not really sure. Maybe it's just what their parents taught them to do. That's interesting. Um, uh, again, not afraid to have a hypothesis. I'm perfectly willing to, <laughs> to find out that I'm wrong. Trust me, I'm not dogmatic. But um, interesting right turn here into other elements of your book, which get into all of our organs, including our sexual organs. If I had to guess, the biting the neck is very akin to, as a guy, thrusting deeper when you orgasm, hmm. which I always found super weird. Like all of a sudden, this one thing feels so, it, it is the thing I must do. It feels <laughs> so right. I'm like, this is just making it better. Nobody told me to try it. Just every impulse that I had was like, do this. Mm -hmm. The same with lordosis. I don't know if you've heard about that and who knows if this research is actually true, but I heard something and I was like, oh my God, that makes so much sense that women actually like the feeling of that posture where you're arching your lower back a little bit. Hmm. And I was like, that would make sense because in certain positions, it's gonna allow you the ability to penetrate more deeply, which is gonna increase the likelihood that you get them pregnant. So you put together the woman wanting to arch her back and the guy wanting to thrust deeper right at the moment of climax. It's like, okay, like that makes sense. Hmm. So for a juvenile lion to just have the, the instinct, I don't know what better word to use for it, where it just, that's the most attractive part. So when you're going for it, every instinct you have has like honed you in on the neck mm -hmm. because from an evolutionary perspective, those that did that got more kills and thusly live longer. I mean, that's obviously a guess, but from an evolutionary perspective, that makes a lot of sense to me. Yeah, that makes sense. You know, the lions that were, had the instinct to bite the tail didn't survive as much because they didn't get as much food to the ones that, um, you know, went for the neck. Uh, and maybe going for the leg it makes you more likely to get kicked in the face or something. So that doesn't make sense. But, but yeah, I think you know that that uh, that desire to thrust is kind of part of the sexual desire. Um, you know, just the feeling you have when, let's say, when when you're turned on, it's almost like nothing can stop you from completing mm -hmm. the act. And clearly, that's part of the the intelligence of the human organism is that like nothing will get in your way from completing that act because that's sort of what the species has has to have to survive um 
And then, you know, as soon as the orgasm's over, everything is different. And that desire just like completely disappears. It's almost one of the few ways or instances in which physiology really turns on a dime and goes from this unquenchable urge to this completely different state and all these hormones and other things are released at that time as well. But yeah, I think, you know, there's an intelligence to what we do, uh, even if we don't understand it. And some of that is instinct. What is instinct? Is it stuff we unconsciously picked up from our parents? Is it stuff that's just, uh, you know, in our genetics? I don't think anyone knows, but maybe we'll know more in the future. Yeah, almost certainly true. Um, as we look at AI's ability to track so many data points and just the, you know, when you think about, we're good at large language models right now, but we will for sure, I mean, this is, again, I don't know for sure, but it seems inevitable that we'll start being able to put other data into AI. It will be able to go through, find these crazy patterns uh, and begin linking them all. AI is super fascinating. Have you thought about where AI is going from a medical standpoint? Definitely quite a bit. And I do think uh, the processing power and I, of computers in general has help, been helping with epidemiologic studies such as in nutrition. And I would love to see AI play a bigger role in, in these sort of large multinational studies on, on things like nutrition and salt and saturated fat and other things. Um, I think they could probably do a lot more, hopefully in an unbiased way, uh, to help us understand things. And I think more processing power is needed and better statistical methodology can help. So I'd love to see AI be applied in that area. You know, I think AI, it's been, uh, I mean, it's been getting better and better. Some of my colleagues have, I, one of my colleagues, in, in fact, uses ChatGPT uh, for, has it open on his computer while he's working you know, beside me in the ER and uses Whoa. it uses it to help him you know, does he need it? I mean, he's been at this job for years without it, but he just started using it recently and actually finds that it helps him write some of his notes or at least some of the things that we have to put in our note is uh, we write a note on every patient we see, of course, otherwise nobody gets, uh, no one can bill, no one gets paid and we get angry letters from our employers. But in that note, you have to put your differential diagnosis, meaning what could this be? The patient came in with XYZ, I found ABC on the exam, the labs show, you know, EFG, uh, what could it be? And you give a list of things traditionally in order of decreasing likelihood. Like it's most likely this, but could also be these other five things. ChatGPT4 is really good at giving you um, those differential diagnoses. Mm. And I've done it with him just for fun. And it came up with just exactly right, like exactly what I would have um, written. The other thing is even Google for years, you know, a lot of doctors poo poo Dr. Google. But Google is great at making diagnoses, um, especially of rare syndromes. You know, you could put in, for instance, blood in the urine and coughing up blood. And it will, one of the first two hits will be something called good pasture syndrome, which is something all medical students learn about. A rare autoimmune condition where you, where you, uh, you know, there's blood in your urine and blood in your sputum. Or uh, I, the other day I looked up uh, swollen joints, rash, blood in stool. And the first hit is something called Henoch Schoenlein purpura, which is a, a not too rare condition in kids. And it, it gets it exactly right. And a, a lot of things are like that. Have you compared Google to AI? I, I have seen it done on AI and it does it better. I mean, the same, if not better. Mm. Um, but it's definitely good at those uh, those, ran those rare diseases that have a very particular constellation of symptoms. Like that, Google's been good at for a while, decades mm. since it's been around, basically. Um, I think it's harder, for instance, to say, let's say this person with a fever and a cough, do they have just a viral respiratory tract infection or do they have a pneumonia that, that needs antibiotics? That's a bit of a finer, uh, a finer point that I'm sure AI will get much better and be better than Wouldn't humans. Wouldn't you need to interact with the patient in some way? Yeah, so, so it's almost like um, you put a whole bunch of clues together. You know, there's not one uh, yes or no answer. There's very few yes or no answers in medicine, blood tests, even imaging. There's a lot of x-rays that you could show to multiple radiologists, and some will say it's pneumonia, and some will say it's not pneumonia. Mm. I've worked in rural hospitals where the radiologists seem to call pneumonia on every single x-ray I do, no matter what. Uh, <laughs> even if the person doesn't have any symptoms of pneumonia, they don't know that. They're just looking at the x-ray. And so a lot of it is, you know, we talk about the art and science of medicine. It's a lot more art than science, to be honest. Um, and so no two artists will paint a picture the same way, no matter how much detail you give them about what it should show. 
And in a similar way, you give the same patient to different doctors, uh, they will end up diagnosing them differently. So to know, yeah, you have to put together clues. So talking to the patient, how have their symptoms been, their vital signs, is there a fever, is their oxygen low, uh, listening to their lungs, even watching them from across the room, how they breathe. That is a, a very important skill I try to instill in uh, the emergency medicine residents I work with in Camden, New Jersey at Cooper Hospital. It's almost more important than listening with your stethoscope to what the lungs sound like. Mm -hmm. It's just looking how someone's breathing and picking up the very subtle clues that they are struggling to breathe or having what we call respiratory distress. It's almost like a sommelier reading all these details that others would miss into the taste and smell of wine. Um, and you, you have to train yourself. You have to look at thousands of people breathing both both normally and abnormally to to kind of refine your sense of of, of is this normal or is this not normal if you walked that's in, hard if you walked into an er um little bay and didn't know anything about that person other than they need attention what's the sequence that you go through to diagnose what's going on assume they can't speak and i and i don't know what they came in with because usually i have a sentence of information yeah, yeah. Yeah. assume you have nothing and they can't they can't speak to you. One of the first things I'll do, just looking at the patient, you actually get a lot of information from their skin, believe it or not. So uh, the skin can take different tones in different kinds of critical illness. I had a patient once who had a perforated ulcer in the stomach, meaning the such a bad ulcer that actually ripped through and released air and stomach contents into his abdomen. Oh. And he was green. And, and I looked up at, the, I saw his skin, I looked up at the monitor, the nurse had already put him on the monitor and his heart rate was 130, so very fast. Whoa. And he looked like he was in pain and he looked sick, quote unquote. And when doctors and nurses use the term sick, that's what they mean by sick, like, whoa, something terrible is happening and we need to like, we need three other people in this room right now to start everything and figure out what's going on. Mm. Uh, you know, when people say, I, and I think it's funny because a lot of, you know, the way parents use, oh, my child is sick. That's not the same word that doctors will say. When someone is sick, it's like they either need surgery like now or they need to be in an ICU or, mm. or they're going to die if we don't do anything. Um, so, so a lot of it's from the color of their skin. And I think doctors talk about gestalt also, meaning just sort of overall picture. Like how does it look? Does it look like something bad is happening or not? And I think a lot of that has to do with the color of their skin. I had a guy just recently who came in with sudden onset left-sided chest pain and couldn't breathe and he looked gray his skin i was like oh boy and I ended up he had no breath sounds on the whole left side of his chest and when i did an x-ray i saw he had a collapsed lung whoa so a hole in his lung had sort of torn not not too dissimilar from the uh, hole in the guy's stomach with the ulcer and air had escaped from the lung into the space between the chest wall and the lung and the lung had collapsed so i could not hear any breath sounds on the entire left side because there was no air movement. The lung was collapsed down and not up against the wall, so I couldn't hear it. He needed a chest tube, so one of the sort of to most- To get the air out? Yeah, to get the air out. Because that air was, you know, that lung couldn't expand against it. It was sort of air locked into that space between the lung and the wall. We call mm -hmm. that a pneumothorax. So one of the most brutal things I do to people, uh, I give them lots of pain medicine and numb it up beforehand, but was basically make a hole sort of under the armpit Fuck. between the ribs through muscle fat uh, membrane and then into the space. And when you pop through, it's like, whew, I mean, that air rushes out and it was like under pressure in there. And uh, how do you stop it from getting back in? So it wants to come out, but then we actually put a tube in and then close up the hole around the tube. But and how do you close the original hole that allowed it to leak in? So it heals itself actually. In, Quick. Yeah, the hole in the lung Whoa. heals itself usually. And then, or just like shuts itself, you know, just by, just like blood will clot toward a oh. membrane that has a hole will sort of stick back together. Um, and so as he breathes, you know, that lung is expanding and just sort of pushing that air out. And you, you also use sort of complicated physiology, but you use a water seal where you put that tube end into water and air is bubbling out, but air can't get back in because there's that water sort of oh, blocking wow. it. Yeah, it's almost like a fermentation lock um, if you're um, brewing beer or making alcohol. Sort of a similar process where air can bubble out through it because you have to release all the CO2 that the yeast is producing by fermenting the sugar. I want to know who figured that out the first yeah, time. Yeah, but air cannot get back in. Um, so That's it's a very similar so process. Fascinating. Yeah, so the human body is just like a vat of brewing beer, basically. 
That's exactly what I would have said. Yeah. <laughs> no, that's so interesting. So diagnosis is something that I'm really fascinated by the ability because you have to do this in business. So I'm constantly doing this in a business. So you're trying something. It's what I call the physics of progress. You're trying something. It's not working, or at least it's not working as well as you wanted, but you have to figure out why it's not working. And then your ability to accurately diagnose the problem is everything. And so in business, it's twofold. You have to diagnose the problem and then you have to figure out what new thing you have to do in order to fix it. I imagine this is exactly what you're doing in the body. So going back to AI, diagnosing the problem, where would you assume you have the sensors to collect the data? Where would you put the sensors in AI if you were trying to, you know, just going back to what, what is the optimal way to live? Where would you put the sensors? Is it, um, you put them in the sewage, you put them in the grocery stores, like where, where would you want to read the data to get at a population level? Uh, what's happening? Hmm. That's an interesting question. You're not talking about like an individual body. Where would you Let's want to go the population sensors? for yeah. now? We can then boil it down, but this will help me figure out what are the things you think we should be paying attention to. You've mm -hmm. been very clear about physical activity. So I'm guessing there's something we would want to track there. Um, but I don't know where else you think at a population level we need to understand. That's a good question. I guess, you know, the, the effluence of the body are one thing and sort of that the flow of yeah, the... like things flowing out from the body. So everything that comes out of us, feces, urine, tears, sweat. Um, and so what, what are the societal equivalents of effluence? I guess, you know, what's in the sewage is certainly a big one. Um, I guess that's our kind of our main one. You know, you could think about exhaled air. Um, there's a lot of studies actually on measuring, let's say diagnosing lung cancer by looking at, uh, exhaled air, you know, is there something that some peptides, small proteins or other markers of a cancer that people are exhaling Whoa. or even in, um, like head and neck cancers, like of the throat, the, the back of the tongue, the larynx, et cetera, very common in, uh, parts of Asia, p perhaps partly due to, um, chewing betel nut and chewing other things that are, might be carcinogenic if you're chewing massive amounts of them all day, every day for decades. Um, and so there's a lot of studies on, ex, you know, a simple, fast uh, um, screening test where they could just exhale into something and it could perhaps read markers of a tumor. I do think that's, you know, that is something AI can help with, right? Look, look at, analyze the stool of a million people, 500,000 of them don't have colon cancer and 500,000 do. And what does the, what's in the stool of those, you know, more in the stool, let's say, of the people with the cancer than not. I, a lot of these things are in very small amounts, which make, makes it hard. But I do think that's something that AI could could help with. And if we have those sorts of screening tests, that would be so much better uh, than what we have now. You know, there is no screening for so many kinds of cancer, pancreatic, ovarian, and, and other common ones, or even lung cancer. You know, there's some debate about should heavy smokers get a CAT scan every year to look for tumors. And it seems like that might be the benefits might outweigh the risk there, especially in heavy smokers, but it's not clear. Well, because the risks are you have to do a radioactive dye? No, no, just the radiation of the test itself. So like a CAT scan is not a, it's not a radioactive dye. Other imaging in medicine is, but it's just, a, you know, a CAT scan is kind of like a, a few hundred x-rays um, from every angle. And then the computer cor puts that all into one 3D image. So you get slapped around with radiation. Yeah, it's like hundreds of x-rays. You know, it's Jesus. almost like taking an x-ray from every side and then using all that to create a 3D image, mm. um, which is how it works. Uh, but it's radiation. You know, it's not great. Um, but it's, you know, like in every everything in medicine, it's do the benefits outweigh the risks. And nothing is risk-free. Uh, so it's all a matter of... Uh, Man, you know, figuring out that balance and and the calculus might be different for different people. I often talk to people about, you know, the risks and benefits of certain things. And I, I say we could do this or we could do that, you know, and there's benefits to doing both ways. I don't think one way is right. You know, what are your what are your values? What do you want to do? What do you think is best for you? So you, you don't think one way of treatment is right because of value systems? Well, sort of like, uh, let's say someone has a a very early skin infection. Um, and some doctors would just say, oh, put some antibiotic cream on it and keep an eye on it and come back if it gets worse. And other doctors would say, oh, start these oral antibiotics right now. And, you know, I often, this is ex exactly how I say it to people. You know, I, I say neither is wrong. Both of those are acceptable. Let's say 
But uh, are you the kind of person who wants to jump on this infection, who wants to jump on everything and be aggressive with treatment right away, and you're not afraid of the possible side effects of antibiotics? Then sure, I'll give it to you. Or are you the kind of person who wants to only take antibiotics if it's absolutely necessary and would rather just sort of go the... Uh, go the the way of using an antibiotic cream and keeping an eye on it, knowing that there's a risk it could get worse and you could end up on antibiotics in a few days from now and it might be at a more progressed state than it is right now. You know, that's uh, I don't think either of those are wrong because many of those infections will turn around with antibiotics. So what's the right thing to do? I, I feel like that's um, a, a big part of the debate about what's the right thing to do is difficult. And that goes back to the art of medicine. You know, it's sort of value judgments. Um, and so I like to give patients the, I like to put the decision making in their hands. You know, I have the key to the prescription medicines because I'm a doctor, but I'll often even sometimes give them a script and say, only fill this in a few days if you're not any better. You know, you make the decision. Here's the prescription for the antibiotic. You decide for yourself because either way is right. There's no wrong answer. Waiting is not wrong, and jumping on it now with an aggressive treatment of antibiotics is not wrong. So I feel like I'm a consultant for people. You know, I'm a plumber. I'm, a, I'm advising what is the problem. Here are some solutions. You know, you decide what's in your budget, what you want, what you want to get out of life, what's important to you, what you're afraid of, and, and you make the decision. What's up, guys? It's Tom Bilyeu, and if you're anything like me, you're always looking for ways to level up your mindset, your business, and your life in general. That's exactly why I started Impact Theory, a podcast that brings together the world's most successful and inspiring people to share their stories and, most importantly, strategies for success. And now it's easier than ever to listen to Impact Theory on Amazon Music. Whether you're on the go or chilling at home, you can simply open up the Amazon Music app and search for Impact Theory with Tom Bilyeu to start listening right away. If you really want to take things to the next level, just ask Alexa. Hey Alexa, play Impact Theory with Tom Bilyeu on Amazon Music. Now playing Impact Theory with Tom Bilyeu on Amazon Music. And boom, you're instantly plugged into the latest and greatest conversations on mindset, health, finances, and entrepreneurship. Get inspired, get motivated, and be legendary with Impact Theory on Amazon Music. Let's do this. What do you do with people that feel like, uh, I don't know enough to make this decision. So my f extended family is going through <laughs> something now and um, it's been me reaching out to everybody I know that might be able to offer a new angle because it is really complicated. And, you know, for all of my self-confidence, even I'm like this, A, the risks are extraordinarily high and B, I want as much information as I can get. But when everybody's like, well, I don't know, there's no right, there's no wrong, it gives a hopeless feeling. It's like, I want somebody, even if they're a little cowboy, I want somebody to be like, I think, like I would much rather a panel of five people who have five very distinct different takes, but they're like, my way is right and it's right for these reasons and you should do it for this reason. And then I can synthesize the five very strong opinions. But the place I don't wanna be is, Everybody's saying, well, it doesn't really matter one way or the other. The, the bad news is that may be more accurate, mm -hmm. but I'm curious if values is driving that or if it's like the outcomes are so complex that it, it's all a, a trade-off to quote Thomas Sowell. Yeah, I think, I think that um, a lot of times, you know, people will say, just tell me what to do, Doc. What would you do? Or what would you do if this was your family? 100% that would be the first question out of my and, and that's, I mean, I tell my family members to ask their doctors that question. I think that's a very important question. Do I think all doctors answer it honestly? No, but I think the large majority do. Um, but, you know, I think, I think that is a good question. I think also sometimes the doctor's decision-making abilities can be hampered when it's a close relative or someone they love. Um, why? Because they're not being dispassionate? They're not being dispassionate. I think there's uh, a lot of stuff that goes into, you know, people want to have doctors with a good bedside manner who are compassionate and empathetic and feel their pain. And that's very important. But when things get complicated or urgent or emergent, you, you want that dispassionateness. But you, wouldn't the, so I, I understand that in the medical field, this is like hard and fast. So there obviously is a reason, but I don't yet understand it. So one would think as long as it wasn't the person performing the surgery, cause then like if it's a mom and she has to do heart surgery on her child, like I could get how, um, 
you know, just the, the physicality of needing to be super calm, like you're, you're going to be hopped up. Right. But in terms of like, you would spare no expense, you would do whatever you thought was in their best interest. Mm -hmm. So from an advisory role, why isn't it advantageous to know and love the patient? It's a good question. I, I think that that has a lot to do with how the human mind works and how emotions can some, sometimes get in the way of your rational decision making. Because you don't want to see them in pain, and so you might not recommend the right treatment? Yeah, I think that could be part of it. You know, your emotions can get in the way of the steadiness of your hand, let's say, if you're doing surgery on your own loved one. But, I mean, it seems like all day, every day, our emotions can get in the way of our risk-benefit analysis or our... Um, you know, rational understanding of a problem and what we think we should do. Yeah, sure, fear of painful procedures, let's say, fear of side effects. I mean, even each doctor, the way we practice or the way we make decisions or the way we'll say, oh, this is a better course of treatment than that, has a lot to do with sort of what we've seen before, the kind of patients we've seen, or maybe even the bad outcomes we've seen before. Like, oh, I, I saw someone who had an, a very mild infection that progressed to something deadly three days later, I'll probably be more aggressive for the rest of my career mm. in treating those early infection, infections more aggressively with antibiotics. And, and as a doctor, you really never forget. I mean, I've been practicing for just over a decade, so it's not uh, that long. But you, I still remember cases from being a med student when either something went wrong or something was just more severe or surprising or the outcome was really bad. You really never forget those cases. Um, and I think that a doctor's decision making is, is warped and shaped by the worst things they've seen, um, which makes me wonder about how things, you know, a, let's say a trauma surgeon who sort of all day deals with the worst possible thing that could happen to people when they walk out the door each morning mm -hmm. and how they go home to their kids and sort of have them walk out of the house and go to school every, every day. I mean, there's a lot of compartmentalization. There's a lot of sort of work brain, home brain. Um, and, and I think those can get in the way of each other, which could be um, a problem when you're trying to, let's say, diagnose or plan a course of treatment for your loved one. What's the worst thing you've seen? Oh, the worst thing I've seen. Well, I guess there's, you know, there's worst in terms of disease. Um, cancer in young people is probably among the most horrific. You know, as an emergency room doctor, I, I diagnose a surprising amount of cancer because people come to the ER with whatever it is, belly pain, blood in their stool, trouble breathing. And it's sort of like I end up finding it and having to deliver the news. Um, you know, I mean, cancer is terrible in any age, even the elderly, but it, it does seem like young people um, with families, let's say, are just, it's really impacts you to see that just sometimes it's a matter of chance. They just had bad luck. Maybe the random chance of genetic mutation, um, you know, whether it, Sometimes it's their own fault, you know, if they smoked for, for decades and now have lung cancer. But even that, there ha there's some compassion there. You know, it's never really someone's fault, even if, even if they're putting the cigarette to their mouth every day or drinking the alcohol every day. There's always something beyond their control. It's part volition and part um, out of their control. Um, but then there's also the, the, what people do to each other. I mean, that's a, we see a lot of that in the ER. We see the results of violence between people. The results of abuse and child abuse and, and sexual abuse um, and and something where actually just the other day I had a young female patient and we suspected she might be a victim of sex, sex trafficking the way the there were two adults with her and the interaction was a little odd Oof. and there was another person waiting outside in a car with out-of-state plates and we were all sort of like what's going on and that just you know those kind of horrible things um, have to go through your mind you know a good er doc every time a child breaks a bone they will ask themselves could this have been done intentionally by an adult whoa you have to because it's so common um do you still even when you ask that do you still miss it yeah you probably report parents where it's not their fault you probably don't report parents where it was their fault um and you have to sort of live with knowing that you're missing that and you know for this girl we one of the nurses took her aside and started a conversation you know, you don't just come out and say, are you being sex trafficked? And, mm. um, but there's a lot more awareness these days of sex trafficking. So I work in a few different hospital systems and there's been many emails about being aware and this is the hotline to call if you suspect and um, just more awareness um, that it's happening, um, which is something that ER doctors, perhaps they're not always as aware of. But 
all the worst things that happen to the human body come to the ER. All the worst things that people do to each other often end up in the ER. So you just see this side of humanity and what happens to people that just can get you very down. There's a lot of burnout in emergency medicine. Um, some of that's just the workload and the intensity, but some of that's probably just um, being that interface with the larger society there where, you know, it's the safety net of the safety net. It's like everything just goes to the ER. And so you see all that stuff and have to have to be aware and have to think, you know, you have to think people are horrible. Keep that in your mind. And could it be some horrible person did this to someone? You know, you have to think about that kind of all day. Woof. That's rough. Yeah. So in all that, obviously, I know the examples from the book, but what what is the encounter that you've had that most stuck with you? And we'll do we'll do the worst one and we'll do the best one just to to balance out cosmically. Sure. I think that, um, you know, in the book, I wrote about this young guy in his 30s who had uh, terminal gastric cancer, and that really impacted me. I was a resident. I was working under an oncologist. And this guy was just wasting away like nobody I'd ever seen. I mean, it was, it was early in my career. His hair was falling out. He was skin and bones, could not keep any fluids down, just like nothing would say in his stomach, food or drink. And his, you know, I admitted him to the hospital and his young wife was there and their two young kids who just looked totally bewildered. And just, I mean, I cared for him for about four or five days while he was in the hospital. And it just... um Part of it was impacted me because what I was doing felt so useless because um, it was so clearly not going to change the outcome here. I mean, so that's why we try to focus on pain and discomfort and nausea and whatever he needs to make his last few days, weeks, months on earth less painful. I mean, that's one of the one of the powers of modern medicine is not just curing disease, but alleviating suffering. Um, and so... That was a really impactful for me. Just un you know, I didn't have a family myself at the time, but still just seeing the impact of this guy, uh, what's going to happening to this guy's body on his family was just very dramatic and something that really stuck with me. And that, that's common, actually. So the dispassionate gaze of the doctor, you know, I see a lot of people coming in on death's door. I see a lot of people who have cancer, are dying of cancer. The last uh, ditch effort at chemo didn't work, and now they're back with worsening symptoms. I see that a lot. And a lot of times, even when people die in front of me, it doesn't always hit me until I, their family comes in and then are just devastated. And then it's like, wow, you know, it, that that's when it really hits you. So, I mean, physiology is fascinating and death is physiologically fascinating. Like what actually happens in your last minutes? Um, you know, why? How does trouble breathing lead to low oxygen leading to cardiac arrest? And that's where the death comes in. Um I was fascinated with that as a medical student. Like, how do people actually die? How does the how does the disease eventually stop your heart, which is kind of the last stop in death? And it, it's it's interesting objectively. But then the family comes in, they're devastated, um, and then it really hits you that this is a person, and you know just um, what it mean what death means physiologically. It means something interesting, but socially, emotionally, in the family, it means something completely different. And sometimes being a dispassionate doctor, you can lose sight of that. But I find whenever the family comes in, it's like you re you get punched in the face with what it actually means for someone to die. So those are some of the toughest things. I would how say. do you how do you deal with death? How do you personally compartmentalize or otherwise? You know, I think I'm really good at compar compartmentalization. Um, you know, I probably don't drive super. I mean, I'm a safe driver, but I probably am not careful from time to time, or I, I know I am, uh, maybe drive a little too fast, even though I've seen people die in exactly that situation, driving too fast, glancing at their phone too much while driving, um, you know, not fully stopping at the four-way stop sign, whatever. There's only so much those lessons can impact your own life. Um, but I do think like doctors are just really, and other people too, who deal with, let's say, you know, dead bodies, let's say a coroner, uh, a funeral home, um, you know, the humans is very good at compartmentalization and as where so you just lock it away. Do you worry that there's a, a day of reckoning for you having been around this so much? Like I could not do what doctors do. I know you've walked a, a maybe more walkable path 
which maybe we'll get into in a minute, but um, I've often said I, I could never be a paramedic. You were, or a trauma surgeon, Jesus. You're dealing with people on their worst possible day. I right. just don't want to be around that all the time. So is there a day of reckoning coming for you where you've bottled up these emotions or do you have um, a way of framing it that allows you to accept it? I don't know. Yeah, I, I think, I think that it's just a way of another example of how humans can get used to almost anything. Just like a lot of squeamish people got used to dissecting the cadaver in medical school. I think when you do it day in and day out, humans are just really good at compartmentalization. I think people are really good at getting used to things that seem horrific and carry on, carrying on with their daily life. You know, a lot of the guards at Nazi concentration camps were family men who went home and hugged their children. Did you read the book Ordinary Men? I've heard of it. Haven't read it. Same. I, I don't know if I'm if I'm up for it. Um, people do horrible things during their daily work hours and then go home and are loving loving parents, let's say, or loving siblings. Um, and in the same way, you know, you can see death and destruction during the day and then sort of still be psychologically normal and available to your loved ones emotionally. I just think humans are really good. I, I think that's part of our. Uh, you know, survival strategy where our bodies are really good at dealing with the practical everyday complications and problems of daily life and getting nutrients from our food and rebuilding our bodies. And we're also psychologically really good at compartmentalizing um, and, and carrying on with life, you know, despite having witnessed or experienced horrible things. There's always sort of the, there's a maladaptive re response, you know, there's the um, like sort of the extreme result, which could be things like PTSD, which certainly can impact you. Um, but, you know, a lot of people who experience traumas like don't have that. I mean, a lot of people do. A lot of people don't. It's something we should learn more about why, why certain people have more, why certain events cause, uh, cause it to happen more. Um, but I just think humans are really good at compartmentalizing. And I can think about my patient who is in a horrible car wreck while I'm driving in the car with my kids and not have a full blown panic attack, um, or even be that anxious. And I don't know, maybe that's, is that the odds are on my side? <laughs> you know, I, I'm not sure. I'm not sure it's a rational, uh, calculation that leads to me saying, well, it's very uh, statistically unlikely that I will have the same result as that person I saw the, uh, the other day. I think it's just more emotional walling off i mean the organism has to focus on the task at hand has to get through the whatever it is the meal the day the car trip from a to b and we're just very good at focusing and putting kind of those things out of our mind i think do you think about your own death yeah definitely uh like early on in covid when i was seeing doctors get sick and i mean none, none that i knew got you know uh, died, but just hearing reports from Italy, let's say when things were exploding mm, there, the hospitals were exploding there and we were all like, holy shit, this is coming this way. I mean, I filled out a will with my wife like early on. Um, in fact, the hospital system had a notary public like available all the time for people to fill out their wills, which was super morbid. And all these people started filling out their wills. Um, but even, you know, I, even that, it was that was more of a rational thing like yes i should have a will um just in case probably should have had one already at this point so why why not just do it now um but even i wasn't the most um worried about covid as things went along and that's another thing you know you work all day in the er you're seeing a lot of covid patients you know are you really gonna like not pull your mask down and sip coffee water eat like you're still you you can't be perfect and the human is good at taking risk and almost walling it off like an abscess, just like our body sort of walls off infection. Uh, and psychologically we do the same thing. I think we're really good at walling things off and going about our daily life. So when you think about your death, so there's the element of fascination, right? So we understand what's your, you understand what's happening at the cellular level. Um, do you use that fascination as a way to, um, soothe yourself? And do you think about like, is there an ideal death? that you want other than obviously just I'm asleep and I don't wake up. Right. I definitely, you know, I've seen a lot of people die and like I seen it right there, like in right the in front of me going oh, from heart beating God. to not beating. Often we're, we're doing CPR, trying to revive them and then giving up. Um, so it's sort of like, and I, you know, the first thing I do after I say, okay, cease efforts. That's what I'll say is you know, stop compressions and I'll 
look up at the clock on the wall and say time of death is whatever and i'll read it and someone's taking notes um and writes that down so it's almost like i'm declaring the death or everyone knows the person's dead you know it's just sort of making it official and there's paperwork involved and so um there's that part of death of course but i think you know to be honest to live until 80 or 90 and have a massive stroke and die i'd sign up for that if i could Hmm. um why stroke i saw that happen first hand it didn't look fun I, I, let me add massive enough that you don't have time to be brought to the hospital so that doctors can try to, you know, pound on your chest and mm-hmm. revive you and make you sort of bed bound for the rest of your painful life. I mean, like instant death would be nice, but um, yeah, I'm doing it via stroke is you're taking out cognition. So you don't, you don't get to process the uh, pain suffering. Is that why stroke versus like gunshot or car accident? <laughs> I'm trying to, cause I, I have thought about this to yeah, a troubling degree. I mean, I probably think about it more than um, the average person, but no, I think it's more so stroke. Um, well, first of all, let's say heart attacks. A lot of them are very painful. Really? Very painful. Just a horrible mm. crushing chest pain, trouble breathing. You don't always die right away. I mean, a lot, especially nowadays, a lot of heart attacks um, get saved. And I'm not saying I want, you know, I don't want a mild heart attack. If I'm going to get a heart attack, make it the big one that kills me instantly. I guess that's not what, really what I'm saying. But I think, uh, yeah, a stroke, especially like a hemorrhagic stroke, you know, the strokes where there's a blood clot blocking flow to the brain, part of the brain, those you're often conscious for. And just, let's say, half your body stops working or you suddenly can't talk or get the words out or you're dizzy. Um, I mean, like a, hem- a big hemorrhagic stroke that basically makes you unconscious three seconds later mm. and you never wake up. There's probably a fraction of a moment where you have a horrible headache, but it's probably very short. And I actually have a, I know a friend of a friend who died recently that way. He was 87, massive stroke. And, you know, no one was there. Did he, did he like kind of flop around in pain for an hour before dying? No one's sure. Mm -hmm. But um, sometimes it's pretty instant or as instant as things get. So I don't need to live to 120, you know, 85 with a huge stroke. I'll take that. Interesting. Why that seems so young to somebody like me who wants to, if I'm honest, live forever, but I'll take 120 over 85 all day. Are you imagining yourself infirm? Is that why? Yeah. So I think, I think what I'm imagining is sort of prolonging life, um, you know, with multiple, let's say multiple chronic illnesses and sort of a degradation in your mental capacity, your physical capacity. Do you have a living will, a do not resuscitate or no extraordinary Um, measures? I, I basically have one that just says my wife will make the decision. Um, interesting. Terry Shivo doesn't come to mind. Like this can get gnarly. Yeah. I mean, I think my, my wife is a bioethicist, so surely she's she's dealt with these questions before, but, uh, I trust her and we, but we've talked about it and neither of us wants to live in a persistent vegetative state, but, um, we've talked about all this stuff. Uh, but so I trust her to make the decision, you know, and when I, talk to relatives, let's say, of someone, I'll often say, oh, what would they want? You know, what, if they were still able to talk to us, what do you think they would say what they would want? And so that's the, the framing is sort of for that person, the power of attorney or the loved one who's making decisions for you. They should think, what would this person want? And really, like, my wife is probably the best to know what I would want in that case. So, mm-hmm. All right. If you had a slow, painful terminal illness, let's call it cancer, would you uh, do assisted suicide? Oh, that's a good question. Um, you know, I mean, I've seen I, the pain associated with certain kind of cancers does certainly seem horrific. And even sometimes the strongest painkillers is not enough. That's a common thing people come to the ER for, which is I have a known cancer. I'm getting treatment for it. But just the pain medicine I have at home is not working. I'm mm. in severe pain. And I'm, you know, doctors, we have our issues with giving strong painkillers and opioids. Um, And I'm much more, uh, we call it conservative than most, where I try to avoid them at all costs. But if someone has cancer pain, I often say to my colleagues and nurses, like, they can have whatever they want. What are you worried about happening? Addiction? Uh, Yeah, addiction is basically the main thing. Um, And, you know, we have a lot of that going on in America partly been fueled in the past, I think, by the medical establishment handing out a little too many, not only the sort of pill mill type doctors who obviously were 
committing various, I would say, crimes against humanity and their profession. But um, even just doctors sort of handing them out more freely, you know, that has largely abated quite a bit. Um, but yeah, you know, you just want to any med every like risks and benefits. Every medicine has risks. You want to give the least uh, strong medicine that will get the job done. You know, for any infection, you want to give the narrowest antibiotic. You know, if penicillin is going to work or amoxicillin, use that hundred year old antibiotic that kills a very narrow spectrum of bacteria. Don't use the new fancy uh, whatever mycin that kills every living organism just to kill the skin infection. You know, you want to narrow things. You want to target your treatments and you want to focus. And in the same way, you know, if Tylenol and ibuprofen are going to take care of the pain, like, you know, why get someone started with opioids? Not to mention the constipation. Holy moly. I mean, people come to the ER for that a, a whole lot. You know, they just had orthopedic, orthopedic to surgery. to the ER for constipation? Just for severe, yeah. Have they just it or not. left it like days and days yeah. and days? Or they took the laxative their doctor prescribed and it wasn't strong enough and they didn't know what else to do and oh. the pain is severe or they didn't take the laxative correctly, or they forgot to fill it, and now they're pain severe. You'd be very shocked at what people come to the ER for. Though some of some of those cases are are worth coming to the ER because um, they just don't know what else to do and are you know really suffering. But also, I do th one of my big things is I feel like the public is not really educated well on what what they can do with over the counter medicines. Like we have so many over the counter medicines available and other treatments. Uh, you know, and but people just don't know what to take, like don't know what to do. Um, and there's no great resource for them to go to, to say, oh, well, try this one. If that doesn't work, try this. You can take this one twice a day. If it doesn't work once a day, add this on, but don't stop the original medicine, you know, stuff like that. Like a strategy. I would love to see a press release from the government to all the American people. Like, this is what you should do if you're constipated. I mean, you could walk down an aisle in Rite Aid, CVS, Walgreens, there is as many uh, laxatives to choose from as there are kinds of oil and fats to fry your food in. It is like a, you know, Shangri-La of choices. <laughs> and But people don't know what to take. So I feel like we need to, there should be a high school course about what to do when you have a fever, what to, uh, reasons to seek medical attention, what to do when you're constipated, things like that. We'll, have to, <laughs> we'll have to get you to like start tweeting these out. Yeah. Um, okay, so what is the most shocking thing that you've seen in the ER that I'd be like, what is happening? Hmm. Shocking. Well, definitely. Let's see. I mean, there's a lot of, you mean shockingly bad or just shocking? Just in shocking. Because at one point in the book, you said something like every moist orifice that we have, people stick things into, which is a very common reason to coming into the ER. And I was like, oh God, Oh yes. uh, is it that? Um, you know, I'm certainly not shocked that people put things in their orifices just because <laughs> I know they do. Um, and that uh, sometimes they can't get them back out. Oh, I've God. definitely seen people with like a one guy had a foam ball in his rectum Whoa. that had gotten a little too far up. A foam, a foam ball. ball. Of all things to try, that one has no handle. This strikes no me as a handle. very bad idea. Right. I've seen, a, I had a woman with a vibrator in her rectum was still vibrating. Oh God. And when I pushed on her stomach, I could feel the vibration. And then, like, mm -hmm. we were getting, I got an x ray. I was chatting with the surgeon. That and at least had a purpose. The foam ball, I'm still the, more yeah. lost that. But actually, stopped, the batteries ran out while she was there in the Thank ER God. and the vibration. Can you stop? If somebody has a vibrator, I mean, that seems. Yeah. But you couldn't MRI, right? Correct. You can't have metal. Right. So MRI is the problem, but x ray CAT scan is fine. Got it. Um, so I've definitely seen a lot of those things. I had a patient who, oh, th this was shocking. Uh, actually, it was my friend's patient. I didn't see them, but I saw the x-ray, which was very impressive. It was a, an adolescent who was had a string of little magnet balls, like the little metal uh -huh. balls. And it was like you, Bucky balls kind of thing? Um, there's totally like, is spherical. Is there actually a string? Or no, no string. Okay. It's just they're attached by yep. their magnetic attraction. They sound like Bucky balls. Little ones. And uh -huh. he was using that string to um, in his urethra. Oh, God. Yeah. And so I guess it went far enough back that it got into the bladder, hook, hooked around and sort of grabbed itself in. And the whole chain ended up in his bladder. It like pulled itself oh in. Oh my God. <laughs> so he needed an orthopedist, uh, sorry, a urologist to go in there with a scope and um, get them all out. But that was- You um, can get them yeah. out with minimal uh, um, invasive or do you have to cut? No, you. so with a cystoscopy, um, you know, medical technology is very good at being able to peer deep into all the orifices of the human body uh -huh. and grab stuff and take it out 
Um, and so the through a cystoscopy is, scope in the bladder, you can grab lots of things. Is he awake for that? Um, he's either completely unconscious or in a very, very sedated state. So we do a lot of what we call moderate sedation, where people are out but breathing on their own. Ketamine is a huge one for, um, for that state and kind of a miraculous drug for that purpose. But, um, you know, when we're straightening a bone, sometimes when we're straightening a, a dislocation, putting it back in place, uh, sometimes when we're even doing abscess, cutting open abscesses, which can be incredibly painful, um, we put people in that state where there, it's not general anesthesia where they need a machine to breathe for them, mm. but they're breathing on their own, but they're definitely not there at all, which is probably one of the most powerful and useful uh, abilities that a modern doctor has, or as an ER doctor that I can do is I can send someone's mind off to another planet while I'm being a complete brutal, you know, uh, so brutal with their body doing things that would be, you know, the worst form of torture if they were still there. What are uh, they doing? So it, this is called twilight, right? Um, yeah, different? twilight. I, that might refer to a slightly less deep level of sedation. There's sort of all various um, levels of So sedation. when you blast somebody into outer space, but they are still there enough that they don't need a machine to breathe for them, are they mumbling? Are they talking to you? Are they no, they're silent? No, they're out. Yeah, but they're brief. So that's actually one, one reason that ketamine is so useful. Uh, I write in the book, actually, in the brain chapter, that many, many sedatives uh, also suppress your breathing drive. Opioids do that, benzodiazepines do that, barbiturates do that, propofol does that, uh, but ketamine does not. It sends your mind to another planet, but you are breathing, your heart's mm. beating, your blood pressure is fine. Um, so it's it's a dissociative. Do you look asleep if you're totally? Yeah, you look asleep. Interesting. Your eyes are uh, ketamine gives you this nystagmus we call it, where your eyes are bouncing back and forth. But usually but your eyes are closed. Your eyes are closed, but if you open them, you'll sometimes see their eyes huh. kind of going back and forth. Um, but yeah, and then sometimes then they come out of it with ketamine. Sometimes people can be very scared or even psychotic and paranoid and kind of aggressive or agitated. And mm. so the side effects to everything, including that, but yeah, it's it true. is a very interesting process and it's so routine even, you know, I do that so often, um, when setting broken bones and other things, sending someone's mind to another planet is just part of my daily job. I've heard about people getting their bones set while they're conscious. And I thought that sounds like the cruelest thing in the world. So was that just, this is pre-ketamine or? Well, so no, even before ketamine, there was various other medicines that you could give. They weren't as safe because they might suppress breathing more, but there was mm. definitely, you know, for so why do so many more. people have stories about having their bones set whilst awake? That seems crazy. Right, well, sometimes um, you can actually inject a whole lot of lidocaine um, or some other, you know, Novocaine type of medicine, all of which are derived from cocaine, the original cane, hmm. which is an anesthetic. You know, if you ever rub it on your gums, <laughs> it gives you uh, it gives you numbness there. And so we use various kinds of canes, bupivacaine, lidocaine, marcaine, articaine, um, which are another one of the most incredible and useful uh, tools of a modern uh, physician. In fact, there's one kind called propericane that comes in eye drops and people with eye conditions or something's caught in their eye or we have to do tests on their eye. You can completely numb their eye and then do things that they would never let you do. Uh, and they're not painful. It's kind of amazing, actually, like getting things out of people's eyes. Mm. You know, what the resistance to things coming out of our eyes, whether it's blinking, flinching, putting our hands up, um, it's so ingrained in us because our eyes are so delicate and so important and so prone to injury. You know, even an eyelash is sort of like this dramatic thing you have to deal with immediately uh, in your eye. And so the that innate uh, response to anything coming at your eye is so ingrained and strong that the ability to numb it and to distract people mm. and to be able to like reach into their eye and do, you know, around their eye and dig things out is so powerful. Like it's one of the uh, modern medicine's most amazing tools. But uh, so with a fracture, you can actually inject a whole lot of um, one of those medicines into the fracture itself. Like you actually aim for the broken bone with your needle, just inject a whole bunch of it all around there and let it sort of seep into the tissue. And you can get a lot of numbing uh, just that way. There's also nerve blocks where if you inject it around the nerve, like let's say you broke your wrist, you can inject it into the nerves, let's say up by the elbow and numb the entire hand and then um, do something hmm. brutal. Uh, that would be very painful. 
uh, nerve blocks are just really cr crucial, just an amazing ability. All right. So the one thing you can't block people from is the moment where the teenage kid has to explain to his parents why he has buckyballs inside <laughs> of his bladder. Correct. Uh, how do you deal with that? Like, are you just stone faced? Like, this is what's happened. This is what we're going to do to get them out. Are the parents not freaking out? Like, this seems like just a brutal moment for that poor kid. Right. Well, you know, telling, giving the news of a diagnosis to a patient is, is a sensitive part of medicine. Giving news to a parent about a diagnosis in a child is, can be very difficult, uh, you know, for doctors, something you dread doing, but have to. Um, so, you know, telling a parent your teenager is a dumbass and got something <laughs> stuck wherever is much easier and more pleasant than telling them something horrible, you know, for that your child sure. has whatever needs even you know needs surgery fine has cancer obviously that's horrible you know i deliver a lot worse news that kind of news probably will chuckle a bit the parent will i'll let them lead on that but if they're chuckling i might join um but yeah so it's uh that's one of the funner parts of the job probably that's hilarious <laughs> How, do you know who chuck polinick is yes so he wrote a story i think it's his friend or somebody he met that had he was masturbating in a swimming pool if i remember the story right but putting the suction from oh, the pool's no. cleaning up against his anus oh, and wow. it sucked his intestines out oh wow and so and i think he oh god I, I might be misremembering but i'm almost certain he almost drowns because it's like holding him to the bottom wow and he finally kicks off with his legs and that's when it pulls his intestines out so now it's like oh i have air but I've, you know, sucked my intestines out right, and ends up having to have some amount of it like vivisected and removed. And I was oh, like, oh, my boy, God. Oh boy. But uh, hearing Chuck, who is a masterful <laughs> storyteller, read this story is unbelievable. That must and be amazing. About like the part of it was the kid like thinking I'm going to die. And now like my parents are going to realize that I'm masturbating at the bottom of this pool. And it was something like all he could think about was I have to get redressed before you know, I die so that my parents don't realize what I say. It's just like so fascinating where shame ends up coming into this, which is actually right. one of the things you talk about in the book. It's like we have certain bodily functions we don't mind talking about. And then we have other bodily functions that we're just completely embarrassed by. Um, what has being a doctor taught you about the human take on our own physiology? Um, right. Well, that is a very interesting story for sure. And I'm yeah. sure the way Chuck Palahniuk tells it is probably um, the best. Unbelievable. Um, yeah, I think, you know, the body does have uh, a variety of fluids kind of flowing all through it. And it also has effluent, as we talked about earlier, things that come out of it. They're all from the doctor's perspective, the, the, the dispassionate doctor's perspective who wants to get a diagnosis, they're all equal in a way. And they're all just sources of information and clues that might help you figure out what's going on. A lot of disease causes some increased discharge or increased effluent or change in the effluent. You know, the color changes, the smell changes, the, there's more of it, the quantity changes, the consistency, uh, you know, the, there's blood added to it now. Um, any, any bodily fluid that seeps out of us can change in those ways. And those are all, uh, you know, dispassionately, those are all equal uh, pieces of evidence that I use to sort of make a calculation and figure out what might be going on with the patient. So, you know, any stool in all its forms um, with blood and without vaginal discharge, things coming out of, you know, things people cough up. Uh, the, the doctor's perspective is just sort of like uh, each bodily fluid is just a raw material to, to, you know, look through, to test, uh, to analyze in order to get information from. So it's all, they're all sources of information that tell you about what's going on deeper inside the body, let's say deeper than you can see with your own eyes. Uh, they're all clues about what's going on in there. Um, and you, you send those bodily fluids to the lab where they can do advanced biochemical testing of various kinds. And the wealth of information you get from them is is really quite impressive. So I often say that bodily fluids are kind of the medium of a doctor's craft, where our craft is reading clues and figuring out what's going on and then treating it. And the, the bodily fluids are often the stuff we're reading. You know, it's sort of like uh, the, the text that we have to analyze, um, whatever's coming out of the human body and whatever it looks and sometimes smells like. Mm. Yeah, you tell some pretty uh, puckering stories <laughs> in the book about uh, first rectal exam, things like that, which were uh, yet another reason why I would not make a good doctor. I just can't fathom. 
Um, we did promise people that we would also give them the best thing that you've encountered being a doctor. So I'd love to hear you've done like really crazy traveling. You've been a doctor like in the Tibetan mountains and all kinds of crazy stuff. So uh, I don't know if it was that or a simple moment in the ER where you were able to save somebody and, and reunite a family. But what's the best thing? Yeah, I would say there, there's very few quick fixes in medicine. Uh, I would say that this is true wherever I've practiced. Um, like you said, I've worked in Antarctica and the Arctic and the Himalayas, uh, rural Pennsylvania and elsewhere. Um, and there's so few quick fixes in medicine. There's so few things where people come in with something severe going on and they are 100% back to normal and better when they leave. Uh, a lot of things are, well, take this medicine for the next seven to 10 days. And if you're not getting better, come back or follow up with your doctor. But there are a few things where you just fix it right then and there. Mm -hmm. um, you know, like dislocations are one example, though not that their arm's totally back to normal. You know, let's say if they dislocated their shoulder, they have to wear a sling for some time. They're going to have pain. They're going to have risk of re-dislocating it over the next few weeks because the ligaments are all a bit looser than usual because of what happened. Um, but there are some, in children actually, there's a very common kind of elbow dislocation called the nursemaid's elbow. Um, and uh, one of the bones of the forearm kind of slips out of its um, a ring of tendon that it's lying in. And the child will not, will not move the arm, will not uh, do anything with the arm no matter what. And there's this very simple, it's one of the most satisfying things in all of medicine. You just take the kid's arm and sort of turn it. You feel a click. The kid's crying and screaming and the parent's like, oh my God, they're worse. What happened? And then you, but I go out of the room for 20 minutes and come back and the kid is 100% normal using the arm. You know, we'll hold the popsicle up and they'll reach with both arms and wow. we're like, see, they're fine. Um, so I feel like those quick fixes in medicine, of which there are not so many, are just super satisfying. Um, I feel like in dentistry, there's some more quick fixes, you know, whether it's pulling a tooth or doing a root canal or something, getting rid of the pain. But in medicine, everything about the dentist is evil. Yeah, right. everything. <laughs> cleaning is evil. Deep cleaning is evil. Cavities are evil. Like, oh, God. Yeah. There's just something about that. I, I don't enjoy going to the doctor, but I hate going to the dentist. I'm, w I'm with you there. And Ugh. I deal with a lot of dental things in the ER more than I kind of thought I would. You know, in medical school, we sort of completely ignored the teeth. I mean, we learned the very basics, but on our cadaver, we never looked at the teeth mm. or dealt with them. Didn't learn about dental disease. And so you sort of have to learn it as you go in a way. Um, but yeah, I think those quick fixes are among the most satisfying, probably for people, you know, um, delivering the, oh, your scans and tests are all normal is probably one of the nicest things because some of these people have just been stewing and stewing and worrying. And, you know, you look up on Google, I was talking before about Dr. Google, you know, Dr. Google is really good at making the diagnosis. The problem with Dr. Google is that it always includes cancer or something right. horrible <laughs> in the list of possibilities. I mean, the truth is cancer is usually in that list of the possibilities. Mm. It's just way down in likelihood, like super far down, like not even worth talking about. But it is there. I mean, it's not impossible that this nothing symptom is cancer. Certainly possible. Um, so I think people, you know, go Dr. Google diagnoses them with cancer or something and they're just worried. Mm. And so just reassurance, as we call it, or just alleviating that worry can be very satisfying and people are just so grateful <laughs> for I that. had a super weird cancer scare that it, it was like, when it happened, I was like, there's nothing else this could be other than cancer. And uh, this is pre Dr. Google. Uh -huh. And I felt a lump in the back of my throat. And it, at the beginning of the day, it was small, but noticeable. And so I'm, I'm touching it with my tongue over and over and over. And I'm just like, I, f I think it's getting bigger. I think it's getting bigger. So I tell my then girlfriend, I don't even think we were um, engaged yet. And she was like, well, you know, you need to go see a doctor, go see the doctor. He's looking in the back of my throat and he's just like, yeah, we do need to biopsy this. And I was like, I knew it. I know like, ugh, obviously like this cancer. And the worst part of that was he sprays some foam oh. that like numbing foam and it rolled down my throat. Oh God, oh, it was yeah. so horrible. I know that foam. But because I, <laughs> you know, thought I was dying of cancer, I was like, whatever, uh, take it out. It ended up being a saliva gland that uh -huh. he was like, you shouldn't have a saliva gland in the back of your throat. Mm. And it really shouldn't get, I guess, clogged or whatever. Mm -hmm. But that was a really powerful reminder of I don't know enough about it to diagnose myself with cancer because there right. are a gazillion things that it could be. So that's actually been a saving experience for me, even though mm -hmm. it was pretty hateful to swallow that foam. 
uh, to remember there are just going to be a number of things that I, who knows what this is. And so stay calm until you have reason otherwise. Right. And I, I usually do that. Sometimes I'll worry about something that's, that's probably another case where my emotion, uh, emotions get in the way of my rationality. But my, uh, like last year, my wife had a rash and it, it seemed like the kind of rash sometimes people get when their platelet count is low. Mm. And I was like, oh, great. She has leukemia. Oh my <laughs> God. I'm going to, you know, like we're gonna have to go through all this i'm gonna be a single father blah 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 and, and then it was like gone two days later we actually got her a blood test her platelets were fine it was gone two days later so like it's funny how it's almost like i'll ignore things to a you know i'll say i'll poo poo some rash or symptom let's say my children have or me or my wife i'll poo poo it you know maybe too long sometimes and other times i'll just be like just off a cliff with worry like the even when it's not it. rational so you're not you know doctors do exactly what what you did so may sometimes knowing more doesn't make you sort of uh worry but maybe that's you know worrying about myself worrying about my wife my kids my loved ones gets in the way of if it was this was a stranger i'd never met before who's like mm. oh i have a lump in my throat i think it's cancer i'd be like Psh, come on it's mm. probably something else let's take a look right um i wouldn't say that in that way but <laughs> i would think that um but with you know with my wife it's like oh boy here we go that's end funny. of lifetime yeah no i would do exactly the same with my wife <laughs> Uh, so you travel a lot. You are a doctor in some really weird situations. Why? Uh, well, I loved traveling before I became a doctor or even wanted to be a doctor. Yeah, but traveling to a five-star resort is very different than going to the Arctic and being a doctor on a ship with like four tools at your disposal. True. Um, well, I love, you know, even before being a doctor, I loved, uh, rough travel adventurous travel traveling to remote places sleeping about on the, that sleeping on the ground um i think part so part of it i think was uh my interest in the natural world and just going to places one where there's less development and the sort of nature is in the state it's something closer to the state it's been in, in centuries Do past you actually feel better or is it intellectual um no it's i think it's partly intellectual i mean often when you're going to those places you're doing some uh something physical let's say hiking or some kind of expedition or mission you know you're and there's a whole uh bunch of kind of emotionally satisfying and intellectually satisfying and sort of social cohesion things going on you know when you're in some kind of mission based uh you know kind of plan or on a, on that course of of activity um and i think that there's something very very satisfying about that there's very satisfying things about sort of being out in nature where sort of things like geography and climate and weather are important you know i'm not in a hospital in the middle of a city where the temperature is controlled and never rains i don't even know what the weather's like outside because i haven't looked out a window in some hours you know everything is smells like disinfectant and all the sounds are beeping and phones ringing and not sort of birds chirping or um, splashing of of animals or whatever so i think being out in those places is interesting from the natural world standpoint seeing different ecosystems different plants and animals i've always uh you know since i was in college loved plants and being able to identify plants and wild edible plants and mushrooms and understanding animal biology and plant biology and e ecology how everything fits together and when you go to a place like the arctic it's just so dramatically different from let's say the temperate climate temperate forests of the northeastern u.s where i grew up or going to the tropics of india dramatically different all different species of plants though some are similar some might be in the same genus or i recognize a plant a leaf shape but clearly this is very different than the ones that i recognize from home but then i think tying into that so that's always fascinated me is different parts of the world and how climate and geography kind of give you a completely different world basically but then how human culture ties into that too how different cultures languages ways of dressing ways of decorating the human body uh, ways of living what plants they grow what animals they eat um, how they build their houses what materials have traditionally been available to build houses with to make tools with um, I, I find that that is very fascinating too you know just as the further north you go the bigger the bears get or the bigger the animals get or the smaller their ears get as it gets much colder Ah, um, so because you don't, don't want appendages bite. yes you don't want your appendages sticking out into the cold so a polar bear while it's much bigger than a black bear its ears are smaller mm. um so those kind of changes you know human culture changes in the same way in response to 
the environment or what plants and animals are available to eat. And that impacts diet, of course, like traditional diets from around the world. So uh, human culture and how it interacts with the natural world has been sort of one of my driving interests in, that led me to travel uh, before I went to medical school. And after college, I ended up working in working and living in Russia kind of on and off for about two years. Uh, and that was totally... Why Russia? That was totally mind-blowing. So I was I took an environmental science elective when I was in college. And my professor was a Russian researcher who was studying kind of like the environmental movement in Russia and how it's changed since the end of the, of the Soviet Union and how international environmental organizations have come to Russia since the end of the Soviet Union and put a lot of money towards environmental preservation and how you know, the local governments and the national governments and other institutions have responded to it and how they're working together and sort of what's happening and are they achieving their goals? If not, why not? And forestry, which is a huge industry in Russia, of course, um, was what we focused on. So I just got an invitation uh, with this professor uh, to be an intern at her uh, research center in St. Petersburg. I knew no Russian. I knew nothing about Russia. Um, and so I just went for six months and then four more trips over the coming two years, traveled all over the country and really got that, uh, that bug of interest in the natural world and human culture, spent a bunch of time with, uh, native peoples of the Russian Far East in the mm. Kamcha on the Kamchatka Peninsula. Uh, but even Russian culture itself in Northwestern Russia, I found super fascinating, learned the language, traveled to a lot of rural parts of the country where... Uh, one part they said I was only the second American in history uh, who had been to this like tiny village and the, he had a textbook that showed the first uh, guy had been there in like the early 1900s but whoa um, so I found all that totally fascinating and basically became a hopeless addict of traveling to remote parts of the world and experiencing the different natural worlds and the different human worlds and culture um, and history and reading about it and learning languages so it was very natural to want to do the same once I became a doctor. I found that traveling around with the goal of researching the environmental movement or some other sociologic phenomenon was not as enticing to do for the rest of my career as traveling around similarly, but with medical knowledge and mm -hmm. skills that I could sort of do something much more practical and hands-on uh, for the people who were wherever I traveled. So traveling as a doctor was like a big goal uh, as soon as I started medical school pretty much now, as you get farther from modern civilization are there um, differences and things you have to worry about like one thing we haven't even touched on today is obesity I'm guessing as you get into these more remote remote places that that sort of drops away to next to nothing or maybe I'm wrong about that um, what have you found yeah so it's interesting you know if you go from the city to a rural area in America, right? You're, you're sort of moving towards wilderness, but mm. the obesity doesn't drop there for sure. In fact, there's a lot of obesity in rural America. I was gonna say, I would guess it actually goes up. Right, so um, there's a lot of socioeconomics that come into play there, but yeah, so, uh, you know, rural parts of America or other developed countries, you, you don't see less obesity. You know, there's so much has been mechanized about the way of life that, um, not that physical exertion is the only, part. I think nutrition is a big part of it too, of course. And I think probably other things we don't understand uh, have resulted in... But wait, wouldn't people out in rural America work more, not less? Like physically? Yeah. Well, I mean, so much of it has been mechanized. You know, certainly the Amish who live near me in Philadelphia, mm. I mean, they're busting their butt. They are the draft animals pretty much. I mean, they are, them and their kids are, you know, I see them. I mean, yes, they have horses to pull the pull their uh, plows, but they are still working their butts off. And where modern farming is super mechanized, you know, G G uh, GPS controlled tractors that make every line of corn mm. optimal for fitting as many plants as possible. Um, you know, there's less physical exertion needed and it's more efficient and you need less employees. Uh, so, so much has changed there too. But yes, as you go out to the wilderness, certainly like when I was working in Nepal at high altitude, there was actually a lot of uh, Tibetan lamas, which are sort of the Tibetan Buddhist form of monks, call them lamas, uh, kind of living in the hills, sort of in caves sometimes, uh, living their monastic ascetic lifestyle. But interestingly, you know, they were rarely obese. Um, I did see there's a lamasery there, which is sort of like uh, where it's a bunch of lamas live. And the head of the lamasery was actually quite overweight. Also had type 2 diabetes, hmm. um, you know, but he's sort of in the 
powerful uh, position of being the head of the lamasery. I don't know what that says for his lifestyle. But even uh, one of these monks, it was a woman who had lived in this cave above the clinic where I worked for over 30 years and spent most of her day meditating, except when sort of pesky tourists showed up and wanted to see the cave she lived in. I was one of those pesky tourists. Um, she actually had high blood pressure and sort of like maybe early type 2 diabetes, like her sugars were high. So every time... Did you get any sense of what she was eating? I mean, she was a very simple diet, not a lot of food, you know, not that overeating. She was very impossible. slender. It seems impossible, but I guess that also made me wonder about like what what's causing these yeah. diseases. It, you know, it, Do you have a hypothesis? That seems so crazy. Right. You know, I, I don't know. She uh, has to be eating high sugar. Glucose is getting into her system, right? I mean, there's right. no way. Probably, yeah. I mean, she's definitely, there's a lot of um, grain growing there. There's, I think it was mostly wheat at that altitude that they were growing. Or maybe it was a, a different grain. But, but she, I didn't see her eat. I assume she's eating maybe a well-rounded yeah. diet. She is sitting a lot of the day meditating. Uh -huh. Is that like being sedentary? I'm not sure. <laughs> wow, this is so interesting. Okay, so this really puts things to challenge. But you don't, you don't have enough information, so it's going to all be circumspect. Right. That's why I'm, I'm just very like hesitant to apply causality when it mm. comes to health and nutrition and lifestyle, just because I just feel like there's so much we don't know, and I wish doctors were tired of embarrassing themselves by declaring the truth and then seeing it overturned 20 years later. Mm. Interesting. Okay, so really fast on that idea that people keep embarrassing themselves, which is exactly why I don't take supplements, but I consider my body composition to be entirely in my control and nothing since my early 20s has proven otherwise because I have a theory on diet, what you can and can't eat if you want to avoid high blood sugar, if you want to avoid fat, uh, putting on adipose tissue, uh, I should have been more clear, and I've taken my blood with continuous glucose monitors, finger pricks so many times. Like I understand what I eat if I want to get ketones. I understand what to eat if I want to spike or lower my blood sugar. Um, I understand how to eat and work out, which is the far bigger important part to put on muscle. Um, so I cannot speak to my arteries or things like that. I haven't had my arteries scanned in, in probably eight years, uh, but have had them scanned at least once. Like for me, I have a framework that I live by. I have a framework that I feel completely confident telling anybody that is interested in um, general health. I, I do not claim to be able to optimize people, but I can get you the sort of general healthy, probably have a decent shot at living to 85 kind of thing. Um, do you not have a similar framework or are you coy about your framework? <laughs> I would say probably a little of both. I mean, I do think that uh, it, it's a combination of the science being not totally clear. I mean, I feel like take any human and give them sort of a better quote unquote diet, which I would say, you know, sure, variety of fruits and vegetables, lots of fiber and, you know, high quality meat, let's say. Do you treat fruits and vegetables the same? Um, I mean, I... I guess I, I often combine them together when I'm saying them. I say fruits and vegetables. Um, but one has a lot of sugar. One has a lot of sugar, right. Yeah, I mean, in, you know, I guess when I think of what's optimal, I often think of what were people doing centuries ago. And like fruit was a special, you know, treat. Mm -hmm. um, Seasonal only. Right. When the plum trees were dropping all their fruit, you know, you gorge yourself, but then you're not having plums the rest of the year. Um, but... I guess I, I probably am more coy even than I would uh, apply in my daily life or to what my kids eat because I think doctors get, have gotten so much wrong um, with nutrition. Maybe being a doctor makes me even more coy or more hesitant to declare causality or declare the truth about X causes Y. Um, what would you do? Oh, this won't work because you're you already have a diet. So let's take our woman in the the cave. Yeah. Uh, if I saw that she had elevated blood sugar, and remember, I'm I'm just an entrepreneur, man. So, but I still have a really strong. I believe that if I went into that cave, one hundred percent, I could control her blood sugar. A hundred percent. She has to eat only what I tell her. Mm -hmm. And so the one thing maybe, if the only thing that we can get access to is, you know, the bread made from the local wheat or whatever, okay, that could be problematic. But mm -hmm. assuming that I can feed her whatever I want mm -hmm. and that she will comply 100%, 
I am supremely confident that I could get her blood sugar in range. I won't say anything. Maybe I kill her, but I can get her blood <laughs> sugar in range. Um, do you think that I'm delusional or are there things that you're confident if I fed her, like I'll just be honest, uh, boiled chicken breast and broccoli, her blood sugar is coming right. right down. Well, so I guess that that goes back to what is available in that local town. And this is a very remote town where there was actually no road to it until just a few years yes, ago. Yes, but that's different than not knowing what causes what. So I'm trying to ferret True. out whether so like... You're saying, though, you would have access, let's say, to a first world yeah, city 100%. supermarket. Yep. Yeah, I would I would say I'm confident that you probably could uh, improve her. You know, I don't know what her cholesterol panel was, but let's say her sugars, her cholesterol blood is one thing I have no confidence in. I do not that's understand it. <laughs> I don't know if it's good or bad. So that's one where my humility is just overwhelms me even in, in myself. I don't know if I'm approaching it in the right way. This is why I say like, I don't know that I don't kill her. Like I have enough humility to understand, like I'm, I'm running an N of one experiment. I'm only 47 years old. So who knows how this plays out? Maybe I die at 47. And in which case everyone gets to point and laugh, but blood sugar, I am supremely confident that I know what to do to lower somebody's blood sugar. And given that so much of metabolic disease seems to be downstream of consuming things that spike your blood glucose. Mm -hmm. I also feel pretty confident in that. Again, arteries, not sure. Uh, cholesterol, not sure. Like now we're getting into the like, I mean, the, the title of your book is The Unseen Body. So now we're into a part that's really hard to get an accurate picture for a lay person like me. Obviously you probably have a lot more like scans and stuff that you have access to. But for me, it's like, okay, that's where I'm like, ah, I have no idea if what I'm doing makes any sense, but blood sugar, metabolic disease, body fat, like these while complex, mm -hmm. these feel very solvable. Yeah, I, I agree. I, I think that you, I'm confident you could get her <laughs> blood sugar under control. I guess there, you know, there's complications of what's available locally, though. Mm. And also, maybe she has like a crazy sweet tooth. I'm not sure. Uh, maybe she loves cornflakes. I'm not sure. I didn't, you know, ask her too much about the diet, but I was impressed by um, but the fact that she had these diseases. But I, I do think you're right. And with cholesterol, you know, doctors that flip flop back and forth about does eating cholesterol make your cholesterol in your blood high, specifically the bad kind of cholesterol. Mm. Um, and we've gone back and forth on that. And it seems now that eating cholesterol has no effect on the cholesterol in your blood. Hmm. Um, that seems to be what the data shows these days. Um, these days. These days. But, you know, give it more time. It's some AI-assisted epidemiologic nutrition research. I look forward to hmm. what we'll figure out. Yeah, that stuff is fascinating. Okay, so let's go back. We're, we're in these remote locations. Um, we're definitely seeing different things, though yeah. we derailed on my surprise over the person <laughs> in the cave with, that's approaching type 2 diabetes. Um, are you extracting any patterns to all of this, or is it really just that's confounding and complicated and I just take one patient at a time? Yeah, I, th I think, I guess I'm my daily job, my best, you know, most uh, enhanced skills, most practice skills, most developed skills are in dealing with the individual patient, mm. diagnosing their conditions and sort of treating them. Um, I do think, you know, she was also in her, I think, 70s, maybe even early 80s, you know, just aging alone, you get higher risk of all sorts of diseases, the body just doesn't work as efficiently as it once did, you know, organs get tired. I mean, that's a silly way to put it. But um, you know, maybe her pancreas isn't up to the job like it was when she was 40. I think, you know, maybe that just puts her at higher risk. I, just, I guess that's just another factor I want to throw in there. Um, but yeah, I think it's it's very variable. You know, you certainly see some genetic predispositions when I worked in Arctic Alaska in the town of Kotzebue. Um, you know, there's certain genetic diseases that are more common. Um, there have been some population bottlenecks in kind of settling the new world and then sometimes with wars against the, 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 gov the U.S. government, uh, putting on the reservation, though not in Alaska, there's not reservations, but for instance, in um, South Dakota, where I worked on Pine Ridge Reservation, there have been a lot of population bottlenecks, which lead to a lot of uh, recessive genes that end up leading what to What exactly is a population bottleneck? Where, let's say, the let's say a bigger population of people gets narrowed down dramatically mm. and then expands again 
but where that entire future population is all all comes from a very small set of ancestors let's say so when you when people get wiped out or when let's say just a few people come to a new land and settle it and start multiplying and everybody after that is descended from this tiny group mm. there's not that many different genes in the pool and so that can lead to more recessive you know more genetic disease basically that's called a founder effect, actually, where there's a founding group that mm. then multiplies. Um, and the genetics uh, ki kind of, you can see diseases in certain populations that you don't see in others. So, Like purebred dogs. Exactly. Right. Exactly. So it's like purebred dog where you're, you're purposely, with breeding dogs, you're purposely narrowing sort of the genetic pool. And mm. in these cases, it's uh, the result of, um, you know, migrating to new land or wars or just a lot of people dying in epidemics and things like that that can cause these population bottlenecks. Um, so there's a lot of actually autoimmune disease that's super common in Native American groups. And actually different tribes have different predispositions. Like the Choctaw tribe is known for high rates of a condition called scleroderma or systemic sclerosis. I don't think anyone is sure why that is, but the, in epidemiologic studies, it shows there's much higher rates. Um, and in the, the Inupiat Eskimo, who I worked with in um, northern Alaska, there's actually um, conditions called spondyloarthropathies that are, are super common. And I did see some patients um, with that condition. Um, so there's definitely the genetic predispositions that you see. I mean, there's certainly a lot of lifestyle related things. So the Inupiat in, es in, in Alaska, they hunt a lot. They fish a lot. They live a, still, despite a lot of mechanized transport, you know, everyone's got their four wheeler and snowmobile and motorboat. Um, they're living a very active lifestyle. They're very injury prone because they're out there uh, spraining their ankles on the tundra while gathering berries or just injuring themselves when hunting and butchering animals. Um, there's even a condition called seal finger where <laughs> people get a particular infection on their finger from seals. And that could either be because they're butchering seals or mm. actually bitten by a seal, let's say a, someone who works at SeaWorld, or a tourist in Antarctica who's getting too close to the seal to photograph them and gets bitten. There's actually, the infection that can result is, does not respond to the usual antibiotics that are Ooh. given for animal bites and other skin infections. So when I started working in Alaska, they, there was like a handout they gave me with, like, these are diseases you should expect here that you probably haven't seen elsewhere. And, you know, don't give that antibiotic the usual one, give this other one, because it could be seal finger. Hmm. And when I worked on a cruise ship in Antarctica as a doctor too, they gave me a similar handout and mentioned seal finger as well because tourists get too close to seals to take that optimal selfie yeah. and sometimes get bitten by them. Um, so there's different diseases, even climate. You know, in India, I mean, I saw malaria and dengue um, diseases that are kind of uh, only in the tropics as where, you know, even in the U.S. where I trained in the northeastern U.S., Lyme disease is, is super common. Mm. When I did a rotation in Mumbai at a medical school, the medical students there was like, wow, you saw patients with Lyme disease? <laughs> like, it was a non-existent in their world. It was this rare exotic disease from the other side of the world. And it was the most ho-hum daily thing um, where I grew up. So, and, mm. and similar reversal of diseases, you know, things they see all the time. I might not see an entire, in my entire career practicing medicine in the U.S. So, you change a lot of your expectations, you change a lot of your understanding, you change sort of what drugs you choose or don't choose um, and things you have to think about as a doctor. Now, when you're practicing medicine in these extremely remote locations, what do you, I'm assuming you have very limited equipment that you can take with you. What, what uh, medicines or whatever do you take? What are the most essential? Right, so it depends what's there. So w when I worked in Arctic Alaska, I had a full lab CAT scan or ultrasound 24 hours a day, but that's in a hospital. Um, on but, the cruise ship. No, this was in a hospital in, so I worked in a hospital in Arctic Alaska and then I was a hospital in Arctic Alaska. Yeah. More than one actually. Well, so oh. there's one, so these are towns, these are towns. Yes. Got it. Got it. Got it. I also worked on a cruise ship in the Russian Arctic that went to the, uh, this Island called Wrangell Island, which is sort of just Northwest of the Bering Strait has a lot of polar bears there. And it was totally spectacular. Um, so I was the doctor on that ship for about 50 people. Um, and these, these boats so are very well stocked. I was actually surprised. Um, but, you know, every northern summer, there's a lot of cruise ships that are going through the Arctic, uh, visiting places like Iceland and Greenland and Alaska and Svalbard, which is an archipelago above Norway, and Franz Josef Land in the Russian Arctic and Wrangel Island. And then in the southern summer, they're going to the South Pacific Islands and Atlantic Islands, like the Falklands and Antarctica. 
this is a huge industry and every one of those cruise ships needs one a doctor on it mm. usually an er doctor which is a great opportunity for people like me to um, get out there uh see these amazing places go on these usually very expensive trips um for free and just provide that service and work while i'm there so um so i did work on a ship in the russian arctic and you know the 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 medicine cabinets are impressive they have a lot of of things um but when you're planning your that kind of trip the strategy of what medicines to choose what uh supplies to bring with you is a very fascinating area that i really like uh thinking about so you, you know you have to anticipate what you're going to see you know if you're going to a place where they're butchering seals you better bring that antibiotic for seal finger or you're going to be in trouble um, so you have to know something about the climate you know what diseases you're going to see the season um, what the light like what activities that people are going to be involved in are they likely to get hurt you know are they rock climbing some sheer rock face uh in the middle of nowhere or are they just kind of staying on a boat then again you know when you, boats go from the southern tip of south america to antarctica they cross the drake passage which is some of the roughest waters in the world mm. a lot of people get motion sickness so you we have tons of medicine for motion sickness from the patches to the pills and even the injectable forms if people are throwing up and can't keep anything down you have to be ready for that and then there's injury too when those boats are rocking and it's interesting you have to know who what kind of people you're, you're going to be treating so a lot of cruises to antarctica there's are people who have had it on their bucket list for years and they're probably retired now which means they're elderly they might have chronic medical problems they're more frail so you have to be ready for and that. They're crossing well. the wild to sea. The, the wild world. Seas, yeah, it's yes, a good which combination. Is why you better hold on with both hands um, at, to the boat at all times. Um, but you, you do see that those kind of things. Um, so knowing which antibiotics to bring, knowing which which conditions you're likely to see, what people are going to be eating, what they're going to be doing. Um, but you, and you have to think, you know, what how easy will evacuation be? I mean, that's a huge uh, factor that goes into the strategizing where will you evacuate them to how will you evacuate them how long will it take what modes of transport are there even f evacuating people from uh kotzebue alaska where i had a full hospital uh, a lot of those people had to be transported to anchorage there was no surgeons no specialists no nothing up there except the er doctor and some other kind of primary care doctors um and so if anyone needed surgery or major traumas needed a trauma surgeon anything they had a many hour trip before them Oof. before they could really be treated appropriately i mean the er doctor knows how to stabilize certain things but uh, and you have to know how to stabilize those things but you know if someone for instance is bleeding out into their abdomen they need a trauma surgeon and if it's going to be multiple hours to the hospital th like the chances are slim Oof. but you have to know how to you have to know when evacuation will be needed like Often I'll know immediately, oh, this person, you know, let's say I see an EKG, I know they're having a heart attack, they need a cardiac catheterization, and the nearest one is three hours away in Anchorage. Mm. So immediately I know what has to happen to get them there, and so I'll start that process immediately. You know, I don't, wanna, I don't need to wait or um, wait for their lab work or something. It's sort of like I know how long this will take, I know this is urgent, so I'll start it now. That gets also into when does someone need to be evacuated or not, you know, their current condition is fine it's not severe but it could progress do i evacuate them now because of that risk do i keep them here and just evacuate them later maybe it'll be harder later when they're sicker or they need it more urgently suddenly sooner than i would have thought um so so how early to evacuate is another question also geography comes into play so when my patients were evacuated from let's say kotzebue alaska to anchorage the plane actually has to fly up and over the alaska range which has denali in it so you, they gain a lot of altitude and so when there's air in the body like a pneumothorax we talked about earlier when there's air if there's a bowel obstruction and the intestines are sort of swollen with air or even after some traumas actually head traumas you can have air inside the head oh you have to think about that air expanding when they go up and over denali mm. in the alaska range so even for instance very small pneumothorax which normally we wouldn't do that brutal act of cutting into the chest wall and putting a tube a chest tube uh for small ones if they're going to anchorage which they usually are we would put a tube in anyway have because to. we'd be afraid of that air expanding when they go up high so there's that kind of geography that has to come into your strategizing too. how bad does the head trauma have to be for you to get air inside the skull that sounds like we're in bad shape yeah usually it takes a skull fracture at least um you know air gets wherever it 
wants to go. And so if your skin is broken and your skull is broken, hmm. it can usually get in there. Um, I remember this one patient just had a dot of air on the cat's on the head scan. Uh, you can just see like a, air in a scan? Yeah. So in a cat scan, it looks black, actually. Huh. Um, each diff, like different densities of tissue are different um, colors. But if you look at like an x-ray of the lungs, let's say, you know, the bones are all white and the lungs are patchy white because there is some tissue in the lungs. You know, there's blood vessels and airways, but most of it's black because mm. the lungs are filled with air. So on a CAT scan, I saw one dot of air inside the skull. And so we were debating with the flight nurses and the trauma surgeon, the neurosurgeon down in Anchorage by phone. What's the risk of this expanding when they fly? And we all decided it probably wouldn't expand that much. So let's just mm. go for it. And then their head burst on the flight. No, it was fine. <laughs> <laughs> Thank God. Thank uh, goodness, yeah. That... Uh, yeah, that stuff to me is is super crazy. Now you said that you like thinking through these problems. Are you a prepper at all? I'm not a prepper, though. I you know, I did mention I've always been fascinated by wilderness survival and understanding how things are made. Uh, I don't expect that I'll need to flint nap for a sharp edge in my lifetime, but if I know how to, in case it came to that, I guess I, I'm just fascinated with it on a I want to know how the world works uh, mm -hmm. level more than I think the world will come to an end. I mean, a little bit of preparation, I think, is wise. And, uh, yeah, and knowing how to do all the things that you might need to do, I'm interested in knowing how to do those things anyway. I, You know, how to turn skin into clothing. <laughs> so um, that might come We're in back handy. to my, my curiosity around you and Hannibal Lecter right, sharing but, too many traits here. Right. It's not that I think we're going to have to go back to the Stone Age or anything, um, mm. but I just am fascinated by it. And it turns out it might come in handy if the shit for the world hits the fan. So That's crazy. Uh, you're writing a new book. What's the new book about? Because we were talking about some stuff before we started rolling that was really fascinating, but I don't know yeah. the the theme of the new book or anything. Sure. So the new book is, so far, it's just a sort of a collection of stories, um, not based on body parts and bodily fluids like my first book. But one of the stories I'm working on now is actually um, about uh, chronic illness in children in the ancient world. How was, ancient are we talking? So... Um, could be thousands of years, but to more recently, I think um, as a pedi you know, I'm a pediatrician and an internist, so I'm trained to be both. And um, I dealt with a lot of chronic illness, both in adults and children. And uh, I came across a really fascinating story, actually, while I was in the Alaskan Arctic, where uh, a lot of mummies, which are bodies that have been preserved through time, come out of the ground there, especially Always after ice, storms. or are there other things that will preserve a body? So dryness and ice are basically the two. They sometimes come together because usually when something's frozen, um, they'll also, you know, it's called sublimation where frozen water um, just sort of evaporates as well, just like liquid water can. Hmm. And they will dry out, sort of like a freeze drying process. Um, so dryness and cold are how bodies mo mostly get preserved. There's also intentional mummification, though, which also sort of relies on dryness, um, sometimes with the aid of salt to draw out fluids, you know. Mummification is actually very similar to, like, curing meat and uh, charcuterie, because you're sort of drying it in a similar way. Um, but uh, so the, I came across a really fascinating story of a mummy that came out, that, whose head was sticking out of the earth in uh, Barrow, Alaska, after a storm. And some archaeologists were called, you know, the first question was, oh, is this a job for the police or is this a job for the archaeologists? Mm. Is this a murder victim from last week or is this an ancient, ancient bo a body? And so they, an archaeologist saw just from where the body was uh, in the layers of soil that were exposed after the storm, they knew immediately it was ancient. And then, uh, and then when they dug it up, they found that this body, it was wearing a parka made of bird skin with the feathers on. And it, so it was oh. clearly an ancient, uh, mm. an ancient kind of dress. And um, on studying the body, they found out that it was actually about a five-year-old girl who had lived um, in the society at the time, which is called Thule, sort of the um, before the Inupiat, their ancestors, uh, the Thule people. And she lived about uh, 800 years ago, so around the year 1200 or so, um, certainly before any European or American contact. Um, and um, and it turned out that on the what we call paleopathology, which is sort of when the patholo pathologist looks at uh, ancient specimens, almost like they would look at a biopsy from a modern person. 
uh, they can do similar processes to look at ancient bodies and diagnose disease and see what was going on. The, the paleopathologist found that this little girl had a rare uh, genetic illness um, called alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency. The way he knew that was by looking actually at the liver. Uh, the genetics of the child were kind of disrupted by microbial growth over the centuries. Even though it was frozen, there's still, you know, microbes can still slowly proliferate and grow and die and leave their genetics mixed in with the human hmm. tissue. But uh, by staining the liver in certain ways, he was able to see that she um, had this protein that builds up in the liver from this condition. And also in the lungs, he found that she had em emphysema, basically, which we call COPD today, which you expect to see in the lungs of an older person who smoked, every, you know, a pack a day for decades. But in her case, she was a five-year-old girl with this um, with this condition in her lungs and the condition in her liver. And so they found out that she had this rare genetic condition. And as a pediatrician who's treated a lot of children, children with chronic illness, uh, I was certainly fascinated in that. And just I enjoy imagining how her society would have responded to this. You know, she probably wasn't growing right. She probably wasn't keeping up with other children. She was having intermittent illnesses that seemed severe. And actually in her bones, when they did x-rays, you could see what are called growth arrest lines, where during critical illness or severe illness, a child's bones will actually stop growing. And you see a sort of horizontal white line in the bone. Why? What What about, I would think if it stopped, you would see nothing. If it accelerated or something, I could understand a change in texture. Is it laying down a deposit? I don't understand. Yeah, so I think it's, it is constantly laying down new calcium, new calcium phosphate, which is sort of the, um, the crystal that's on bone. Um, and that gives it its, its hardness and its strength. And so um, the, there's different processes of going on at the same time in a growing bone. There's the actual growth that lengthens the bone. And there's, act, and there's also the calcification or the deposition of this calcium phosphate. You know, chil very young children, their bones are almost ru like rubber-like, more hmm. made of cartilage than bone. And when you, when you x-ray children... There's a lot of bone missing, actually, because it's still cartilage. Really? Yeah. And so that process of turning it into bone or the bone sort of replacing the softer cartilage, um, you know, th that process continues even though the bone might not be lengthening due to perhaps a, pro a combination of the, let's say, the illness itself, the infection sucking up resources and nu nutrients and the person probably not eating as well because they feel terrible or throwing up. Um, so it, it de deposits calcium phosphate in this way that leads to this darker than normal horizontal line. And she had multiple mm. in her long bones. Um, so, you know, by, by digging up this body and by doing this paleopathological investigation, you almost can read these stories from her life. And I sort of love imagining how her parents and the society at large would have responded or would have thought about this girl or who did they go to for help? Was there a doctor figure or a shaman or a leader? Who did they ask? What did they think? And how did that Im impact the way her parents saw her disease and saw her honestly slowly waste away? The investigation showed that she probably died of starvation. Um, in, her lung in her stomach, there was a bunch of fur, which is usually a sign that she was eating animal skins, which everything most things they owned were made of animal skin their clothing their bedding mm. so and it'd so, be like eating shoe leather it would be like eating shoe leather right I, I don't think she was going for the hair probably more for the skin attached to the hair but then mm. again you know you fill your stomach with whatever you can um to alleviate the hunger pains whether or not it's going to actually be nutritious or not there was some soil in her stomach so Jeez, she could have been eating that's... soil fur you know whatever to maybe her parents wanted to put something in her stomach Maybe they knew she was dying and just wanted to alleviate the hunger pains. Um, and so sort of all those questions about chronic illness in our society, chronic illness in the ancient world, and chronic illness in a culture where they're living this incredibly interesting and different lifestyle where a lot of, you know, they're hunting whales um, in the sea and eating a lot of blubber and they're living in these semi-subterranean houses and heating and lighting them with lamps with seal oil in them and things like that um, so i think that that'll be probably one chapter in the book and others will explore different stories that the human body can tell uh, if you know how to read them basically man utterly fascinating your book was wonderful the unseen body i definitely hope people check it out where can they follow you to learn about these crazy stories that the body tells 
check out my website, www.jonathanreisman.com. I love it. All right, everybody. If you haven't already, be sure to subscribe. And until next time, my friends, be legendary. Take care. Peace. To learn more about nutrition and aging, check out this interview with Matt Caberline. There is a real science of aging.